Kicking off our list at number 10, rat poison. Yeah, this one's pretty uh, pretty gross right off the hop. During the 16th century, it was common to fill your house with arsenic trioxide to keep rats from your food supply, right? You don't want those guys hanging around. They're bringing the plague in, a little nasty. Barbara Gilbert of Leicestershire, she thought that she was grabbing flour and ended up mixing this stuff with milk. That was a really bad mistake. She thought she was preparing a meal for her family when really she was about to poison them. Now, it's horrible to say, but Barbara, she took a sip, thankfully, before for her family, and then she was thankfully the only person who lost their life because of this, you know, poison that they made. It's tragic, but it could have been much, much worse. Everyone dying because of a rat poison plague? That's pretty horrible. But it happened again in 1599, when Margaret Moreland thought she was giving her husband ale. Really, it was arsenic trioxide and water, aka not ale. God, that would really suck. What a horrible mishap. Number nine, famine. Back in medieval times, food supplies solely relied on good weather and proper harvests. And obviously, lack of rats definitely helps. If the seasons were dry, people, of course, starved. More often than not, common folk would survive on rations of berries, corn, and wheat. Now, the lack of food, of course, led to disease. Now, if they didn't starve to death, illnesses like tuberculosis, smallpox, typhoid, influenza, and mumps often did the trick. The Great Famine of the early 14th century was historically awful. Between 1315 and 1322, it rained for 150 days at a time. That's, uh, that's a lot of water. Western Europe was a mess. These conditions took the lives of 15% of England. Farmers couldn't plant or harvest crops, and the winters during these years were historically bad as well. Insane rainfalls and severe freezing. We're still struggling to adapt to weather changes today, but imagine the dark ages. Weather sucked every day. It was horrible. Number eight. Weather witch. Aside from that little ice age I just referenced, what was the weather like for most of these medieval travelers? Five seasons of Game of Thrones. They talked about winter coming, but what were those winters really like? People in the 1400s believed that bad weather could be caused by the behavior of wicked people, like killers, those who sin, incest, that was a pretty bad one. Game of Thrones would have been screwed off the hop. That would have been a lot of horrible weather. Even family arguments were to blame. You talk back to your mom, next thing you know, the crops are frozen. Nice, way to go, Eric. It's on you. Now this eventually linked back to blaming witches or sorcerers who some believe could control the crops and or weather. Yeah, sorcerers controlling your crops, imagine that. The Malleus Maleficarum, published in 1486, this book straight up references a witch that would fly in the air and create storms. Yeah, with effects that took lives of animals and farmers. No thanks, I'm glad we don't have any of those floating about. We just have drones now, which are just as annoying. Number seven, Jesus take the wheel. With witches to blame for hailstorms, who do we turn to to fight the powers of evil, right? How do we get some goddamn crops back in the game? From the 14th to the 16th century, the ice pack grew around the world. Weather was changing in a drastic way, and by 1550, there had been an expansion of glaciers worldwide. Everyone thought that it was witches causing it. It's like, no, just plain old science. Back then, the general public didn't know what was happening. They didn't have Neil deGrasse Tyson explaining the phenomenon on a podcast. So people in the medieval times would perform rituals for harvesting crops in hopes that something would change. There would be special prayers, charms, beautiful services, all to ensure proper weather and fertility of the fields. Certain saints, like historical saints, they were believed to protect against harsh conditions. To protect us from the frost, we had Saint Surveys, and to shield us from the winds, we had Saint Clement. And to fight back against drought and the rains, we had the one and only Saint Elijah, or Elijah. The power of the saints and the Virgin Mary were believed to protect against storms and lightning. So that's like the medieval version of the Avengers, I guess. Tis the season. Thank you, Saint Mary. Let's keep it dry. Canada has a huge storm coming tonight, so could use some of that saint power ASAP. Number six, violence. Imagine going outside in medieval times. Is it dangerous? Is it lonely? Is it full of criminals? What's it like? What were those odds like just to get home? Street violence and brawls and taverns were as common as they are today. And like we saw a few times in Game of Thrones, peasants got a bit fed up from time to time. Yeah, I can't imagine why, huh? Vassals would revolt against their lords. This happened historically a few times. The rebellion of peasants in Flanders, this went down in 1323, and then 60 years Years later, England saw the peasants revolt in 1381. A lot of peasants getting fed up. Yeah, I, I would assume. I'm surprised it took that long, really. Number five, pole vaulting. The day pole vaulting was born was December 25th, 1521. It was a Christmas miracle, some would say. A laborer named Robert Baker, he was heading home from the church after a Christmas gathering. Severe floods interrupted his normal commute home, classic medieval flash floods. So Robert Baker, the quick thinker that he is, he grabbed a tall pole and he just 
Huh? He just vaulted his way over this new stream that had appeared. And then he then continued home. He just carried the stick home and he was like, what have I done? What have I invented? Now at Bumblebee, we don't recommend this as a commute. Don't pull vault over things in general, unless you're a professional, don't do that. Because later on, when attempting that same stunt, Baker's pole snapped mid-leap and he ended up drowning. Yeah, the poor guy bridged the terabithia himself. You don't want anything to happen like that. That's, that's really bad. Again, in 1540, a similar case. Somebody tried to leap over a pond, but the pole wasn't strong strong enough and it broke and they drowned. Do you pull vault? If so, comment down below how scary it is to learn because I'm interested, I don't know. Number four, falling bacon. If they ever made a Final Destination movie that takes place in medieval times, that'd be an odd pitch, this would be the opening scene for sure. This is crazy. Not sure how true this is, but if so, Oh boy, my palms are sweating. It was February 12th, 1543, and Elizabeth Brown was working as a servant in the household of a man named Hugh Talmash. Now this was over in Huntingdon. Things were going swimmingly, I guess, until a tragic accident occurred. Elizabeth was the victim of a freak accident while sitting by the kitchen fire. A massive, unsliced chunk of bacon was suspended in the chimney above her to smoke over time. And that day, the rope decided to just go, and then said bacon ended up crushing her. Now, if you're smoking meats, don't put Put it above or near you. That's a, that's a bizarre way to smoke meat. And also, if you're smoking meat, must be nice. That's a crazy charcuterie board. Number three, outhouse troubles. This next one really stinks, my gosh. If you're eating food right now watching this, maybe skip to number two. I won't take it personally, here we go. On June 2nd, 1523, a Cambridge baker named George Duncan went out to his back garden to use the medieval outhouse, AKA the cesspit. Now today they're built a little differently, but back in the day it was a massive hole with a wooden rim. It wasn't pretty, it didn't smell great, it was horrible, it was made you sick. Now Duncan, the poor lad, rumor has it, he was was a little intoxicated, and Duncan, while doing his business, fell into said cesspit, leading him to suffocate to death in the worst way imaginable. Now, it sounds like a crazy way to go in medieval times, but it can happen today as well. Because in 2014, two people lost their lives trying to recover a cell phone that fell into a porta potty. Yeah, imagine that. Losing consciousness and feces is a dangerous place to do it. That's very horrible. That's a horrible way to go out. That's the worst way to go out, I think. That's the worst. Number two, clocks. Yeah, if you think a piano falling on your head is insane odds, now imagine a clock. Welcome to the medieval times. The 16th century saw the beginning of clock making, and early on, these things, they were units. They were massive. Great, great grandfather clocks, these early mechanical pieces, they were made of metal and were chock full of machinery. Weight equals danger. And in 1513, a man named John Townsend was holding an iron clock, very proud, when all of a sudden it slipped from his hand and it hit the young man right next to him. William Brett it hit him right in the forehead and the next day Brett died of his injuries. Guy died because he got hit with a clock. What a way to go. And finally number one, horse racing. I think it's general knowledge at this point but standing near a racehorse equals not a good idea. Right, you heard it here first on Bumblebee. January 16th, 1540, two riders named Henry Headlam and Brian Newton, they were racing back and forth along a wall in a garden right outside of London. Casual medieval time stuff, just racing horses. Now, Newton's horse was going quite fast and Newton didn't realize that he was approaching an elm tree. Now, his head hit a branch from the tree and he broke his neck and died the next day. Now, right after this first tragic death, racing was seen as a danger to spectators and riders. More than fair. Riding a live animal at top speed yeah, that's obviously a little bit dangerous, I would assume. But then in 1534, Jane Jones was just watching, not even riding, she was watching horse racing, and then out of nowhere, a horse trampled her. Yeah, four days later, her injuries got the best of her. So if you're watching any live horse racing this afternoon, I don't know, have some distance maybe. Move up a couple of seats in the stands. Horse racing is big in uh, Ontario for some reason. I don't know, we have like one big one, constantly busy. Eating with the rich starts off the countdown at number 10. Medieval recipes depict a large variety of animals being served. Adding to the ones I listed previously are horses, lampreys, cranes, and crows. Hell, even beavers. And let's not forget the animals created by their chefs. One homemade animal was called a cock and trice, and it was actually multiple animals' bodies put together before being roasted. A helmeted cock was another chef creation. It was a roasted chicken wearing a tiny helmet that was sat on the back of a roasted pig, because 
why not? Dinner in a show is always fun, so in late medieval Europe, it became fashionable to have an entremetta, which was an entertainment dish. One such example is bakers cooked a pie shell in advance, and then after it cooled, they placed live birds inside the pie and resealed it. When cut at the table, the birds would then all fly out of the pie, much to the amazement of the many banquet guests, assuming that all went accordingly. FIFA fans may want to skip out on this next one, because number nine in our countdown is making football illegal. That's right, while I may be referring to it as primarily soccer in this video, what was still called football at the time was made illegal in the medieval ages. Now there are quite a few reasons for this. Most popularly known is that the sport was extremely different then. It was violent and aggressive, resembling more of a mass brawl with minimal rules. However, it was also because only two years after soccer was banned in 1363, King Edward III would implement a mandatory archery education law. This would ensure his villagers could be used as soldiers soldiers should need be. King Edward believed that soccer, but also sports in general such as handball, football, hockey, and cockfighting were distractions and at that time they could be doing better things. I'm sure there are many of you that would disagree. Next on the countdown is number 8, the future predicting friar. There's a lot to unpack here so I'll just jump right in. English Francican monk Roger Bacon is known through history for his shockingly accurate predictions of the future transportation and life that we have now. Bacon lived from 1214 until 1292 and was the successful creator of the magnifying glass. But he also famously predicted future machinery in his book Espetola de Secretis Opribus, if I got that right. Cars can be made so that without animals, people will move unbelievably rapid. And flying machines can be constructed so that a man sits in the midst of a machine, revolving some engines by which artificial wings are made to beat in the air like a flying bird. It's a little nonsensical, but you you can see what he's implying. His other predictions included steamships, submarines, diving suits, and telescopes. That's pretty spot on for a guy who lived thousands of years ago. This is the same man who was also said to have sculpted a prophetic head of brass. Apparently having been warned by a spirit that he must listen to whenever the head first spoke, Bacon set his assistant Miles to watch over the sculpture, which he did even past Bacon's demise. It's said that after the friar's death, however, that was the first time it spoke. First saying, Time is. Then, time passed. Ignored both times by a confused mile, the head spoke only once more to say time is past before it exploded into flames. And so the chance to consult the mysterious head was lost when it combust. What do you think of the legendary Bacon and his stories of mysticism? Time is past, as the sculpted head said, so let's be happy we left this weird tradition in the past. In at number 7 in the countdown, it's the medieval animal trials. Under the ruler's power, there was no exception to medieval law, and so it should come as no surprise that even animals could face the brunt of their alleged crimes. This was no casual affair. The rich and the poor gathered for these trials as spectators. Some of the accused animals were even dressed in wigs and gloves fancy garments to be seen in front of the royal court as their fate was debated by the lawmakers. That should come as no surprise either, seeing as the medieval era wasn't exactly overflowing with entertainment outlets. There are records of at least 85 animal trials that had taken place during medieval slash middle ages. And while the most serious offenders were pigs by a landslide, there are records of some roosters and even one donkey facing the judge. What were these animals being charged for, you may be asking? Many times it was the act of attacking hacking or eating humans, as food and grain for animals was so sparse they'd often go hungry. There were also some accused of being heathens or thieves or behaving in lustuous ways. So make sure you have a walking buddy and always look over your shoulder because I guess you never know when an ill-attentioned cow may be creeping up on you. Number 6 in the countdown is the St. Scholastica Day Riot. February 10th of 1355, a group of students who attended Oxford University decide to go into town for a pint at the swim Stock Tavern. Little did they or anyone else know that this would be the start of a notoriously famous riot. It started with belligerent complaints to the tavern owner about the quality of their drinks and service. As the tavern owner was progressively more berated, he and other patrons lost their temper with these 
students. The escalation led to a verbal sparring between the students and bar patrons. Both sides ended up arming themselves, but luckily, things were quickly interrupted when the mayor stepped in and demanded the arrest of the students who had harassed and assaulted the tavern owner, thus sparking this whole disaster. What should have been a peaceful resolution caused a chain reaction, however. Oxford students rose up in protest of their peers' arrest and swarmed to attack the mayor. News of that quickly spread, and the townsfolk revolted immediately. Many of them were already very tired of these students and their entitled complex, and had been waiting for the opportunity to rage against them. The riot that occurred ended the lives of 63 students and 30 locals. While the case's investigation led to Oxford winning against the town in court, the Oxford Council was still made to parade shamefully through the village every year on February 10th, and they did have to pay a fine to the families of each student lost. For number 5, we're getting a little spicy with Risqué's men's clothing. Now, you may have already heard stories or seen memes about ridiculously long pointed shoes and groin flattering armor, but did you know that provocative men's clothing was all the rage for a period of time in the medieval era? It's recorded that in the late 14th century, men were quite keen to be seen in overtly short tunics and thin tights. By 1463, a modesty statute had to be passed as men had upgraded to wearing cod pieces publicly, which did cover their mostly exposed genitals, but only by making them look cartoonishly large and bulbous in the process. A similar escapade happened with the Krakow shoe. These long, pointy-ended shoes were sometimes so long that they had to be tied back around the wearer's ankles or reinforced inside with a whalebone. The same statute in 1463 also addressed limiting these Krakow shoes for those reasons. Seems like there may be a little bit of a compensation theme here. Both provocative dressing and shoe length were limited to those of extreme wealth after the statute passed. But that didn't stop the development of some more outlandish beauty standards. For example, number four in our countdown is Plucked Bear. Nowadays, whether you're scrolling through an app or walking down the road, you're likely to see advertisements for eyelashes and hair accentuation services. And while that may be pretty trendy and normal to us, now, in the medieval ages, having hair on your face would have actually made you stand out in a crowd. Women would remove their eyebrows, eyelashes, even significantly reduce their hairline so as to achieve a smooth egg-like effect. This was because the forehead was considered the center point of the face for many years, and so it would make sense to remove anything on or around it so as to accentuate it, right? Maybe. Moving on. If you're tired of her plucking herself bald, and she's tired of you wearing shoes that enter a room before you do, then maybe it's time for a good old fashioned medieval divorce by combat. That's right, you heard me. Coming in at number three is divorce by combat. This finding was discovered in a historic German manuscript that laid out rules as to how divorce by combat was to proceed. Their decision to use combat as a means to solution was not unusual for medieval Germany, as trial by combat was part of their law system. Trial by combat was legally sanctioned duel that ensured whomever was to win the fight was deemed Right. There are many ways that these duels could be fought, and various weapons and locations in which to have them. The divorce by combat trial was placed when a man was put into a three foot deep hole with one hand tied behind his back. The woman, however, would have a normal ground and be able to move freely. This was believed to ensure a fair fight between the sexes. Now, there is some evidence that the outcome of these trials could still end in death, even if the death was not as a result of the combat. It's said that if the man lost to his wife, he would be taken from his hole and executed in the town square. If the woman lost, she would be then placed in the hole and then buried alive. So yeah, I'd say maybe try talking it out a little bit first before resorting to a public throwdown that can end in death. And while we're on the topic of trials, number two on the countdown is trials of the dead. Who would have such a vendetta with the dead that they would have them unburied to stand a trial? Well, new Pope Stephen, that's who. In 897, the months old body of Pope Fomorpheus, the first pope to ever be executed, was extracted from his grave to serve trial for his alleged usurping of papacy. The new pope donned the corpse in elaborate robes and even assigned a deacon for defense. You may 
be wondering why the new Pope Stephen had done this to his predecessor. Since a holy person's body was considered to become a holy relic in death, it became a holy rite to display their corpse in public tombs or churches so petitioners may still visit their former saint to leave tokens or deliver prayer. What better way to ensure that you have devoted attention of the community than a postpartum smear campaign where your opponent can't defend themselves because, well, they're dead. Stephen found the deceased Pope from Morpheus guilty so that he could toss his body into the Tiber River, as nobody can venerate his relic if his body is lost at sea. That's a pretty intense way to upsurp the person who had the job before you. Jokes on Stephen, however, as shortly after this trial, he was executed just like his predecessor, making him once again come in second to Morpheus. Call it karma. With that dose of crazy, we can move on to Medieval Madness, which ranks at number one in our countdown. What was the Medieval Madness? Well, if you're a fan of rye bread, you may not want to listen in on this. In an era without refrigeration systems as well as poor hygiene, produce was left to natural elements. As a result, mold and bacteria growth was common and would of course migrate into food. Ergot mold is the most well known for its effect on the brain. It caused wild hallucinations and extreme emotional changes as the chemicals in your brain became imbalanced. The consumption of this mold and bacteria has had a variety of exclusively unpleasant side effects, such as vomiting, diarrhea, convulsions, delayed visions, even mania and psychosis. These symptoms make it obvious as to why this could be labeled as a madness. The extreme cases of ergot consumption would of course lead to things such as loss of limb, gangrene or death. And this connection between molding rye flour and ergot poisoning wouldn't be made until 1670. So for hundreds of years beforehand, commoners saw ergot poisoning to be things like demonic possession. Many theorize and connect the medieval madness to that of the time periods of the witch trials. The trials began in 1691, a year of intensive wet and cold which produces a higher level of ergot. They ended abruptly in 1693, a year said to be sparse on rye grain. If there's less to consume, there's less ability to be poisoned. Making it arguable that there could be a connection between the two, especially as a side effect of ergot poisoning could be mistaken as demonic possession as previously mentioned. And that is also seen as a symptom of witchcraft. Still, this may not be the kind of bread you want to chase. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the leech collector. This job truly is exactly what it sounds like. It's a person who is responsible for the collection of leeches. The little blood suckers were a popular treatment back in medieval times when just bleeding was a common treatment for a variety of ailments. Headache? Just bleed a bit. Common cold? Have I got a solution for you? Bloodletting, especially by way of leech, was actually used medicinally for thousands of years with possible ties to ancient Egypt. This medical treatment, however, of course, required leeches, which meant that someone needed to collect them. Many leech collectors were people who didn't have a lot of money, and more commonly, women. The job required wading in the water and searching for leeches, and how do you catch them? With your legs, of course. Leech collectors would wait for leeches to latch onto them, and normally would have to wait for about 20 minutes before pulling them off because they were easier to remove after getting fat with blood. How horrible. This already sounds awful, but what's worse is that after being bitten by a leech, the wounds tend to bleed more than a normal cut even would. This was great to get more leeches interested, but bad as a human who was trying to keep blood inside of their body. This job usually led to those who did it to contract illnesses from the leeches, their open wounds, or just have severe blood loss because at the time, people didn't know you could overdo it with bloodletting this way. In our number 9 spot today we have the fuller. Wool is a clothing staple. It's been used for centuries, but back in medieval times there was a disgusting part of the job that thankfully doesn't exist anymore thanks to the invention of modern chemistry. Wool is naturally waterproof due to the fact that it contains oils that have been distributed from the sheep's skin. And these oils are what made the entire harvesting, carding, spinning, and weaving processes possible in these times. This is all fine and well, but the trouble comes in after all of that because the cloth at the end of it all was coarse and easily frayed. And this is where the job of a fuller came in. They were tasked with removing the oil from the cloth. Okay, a little alkaline solution, no problem, right? Well, yeah. Except for in these times, the most accessible and cheap alkaline solution was stale urine. Yep, just a bunch of old pee. A fuller had to take this new woven material, put it into a tub full of old pee from who knows where, and then you stomp on it with your feet. And then you get no shower at the end of it either. 
carpenter. What's a carpenter without his tool belt, right? What I mean is that fullers were also responsible for collecting their own pee to use for the wool. So they often needed to head to all the local public toilets and private homes to collect it. Just gets worse. In our number 8 spot today we have the groom of the stool. This job doesn't sound too bad with just the title, it weirdly sounds kind of regal. I mean it was quite a prestigious position during this time, but it also was one of the most humiliating jobs in history. In the medieval times, kings were looked on almost as if they were gods, you know, it's their divine right. And because of this divine right, for centuries it was deemed improper for a king to wipe his own behind after using the facilities. This is where the groom of the stool comes in. This high level nobleman would be responsible for fetching the toilet chair for the king when nature called, and he would also be in charge of the wiping aspect of the whole thing. No bidets, I guess, back then. The groom of the stool also played a role in monitoring the king's health as he was tasked with examining the stool just to watch for any serious changes. And should the king be having some digestive troubles at any point, the groom of the stool would always be nearby and ready to administer a royal enema. In our number 7 spot today we have the nightman. This is definitely one of the shittiest jobs from the medieval times and I mean that quite literally. Also referred to as gong farmers, these people had the unfortunate job of cleaning out all of the human waste from the cesspits in the castle walls which they would then transport to a pre-arranged location where it would be buried. These cesspits were the medieval equivalent to a septic tank and they were usually located on the lowest level of the castle. The nightmen would end up digging through weeks, months, just sometimes even years of disgustingness and they were motivated to gather as much as possible considering the fact that they were paid by the ton. Imagine, that's a frightening amount of work. The job was also quite hazardous too. I mean if we really think about what exactly they are doing, it quickly becomes clear that many of them died from disease and there was also a good chunk of people who suffocated on the job as well. In our number 6 spot today we have a sin eater. Okay, This is definitely one of the strangest jobs on this list. The job of a sin eater was to, well, eat sins. To do this they were tasked with eating a piece of bread that had been placed on the chest of someone who had died. Definitely not an ideal day of work for me personally. The idea behind this was that in consuming the bread they were consuming the sins of that person so that they could carry on into the afterlife peacefully. Basically sin eaters were willing to sacrifice their own souls and their own eternal happiness just to make some money while they were alive. I'm not sure what's worse, taking the risk with the sins or eating bread from off of a dead person. You know, both bad. In our number 5 spot today we have the executioner. We have all heard of this job before. After all, an important aspect of the medieval times was the fact that they were trying to have better criminal law enforcement, which naturally meant that a ton of people were getting executed for their crimes. While there is of course now the stereotype of people who did this work as being these huge hooded evil people, history shows that this stereotype is largely untrue. Most of the people who fell into this job didn't come into it because they wanted to. In fact, most people of course saw this job as being undesirable, but the job usually was bestowed upon them. Sometimes butchers were called for the job because of relevant experience, other times it was criminals who could either do the job or face their own death sentence, and most commonly people found themselves in the job because their fathers had been executioners before them. Aside from the nitty gritty of the job, I mean the horrors of the work itself, it's obvious, another part of being an executioner that sucked was the fact that people didn't really want to associate with you. Execution Executioners were usually on the fringes of society and outcast, sometimes even forced to actually live on the edge of town. In our number 4 spot today we have cat gut. Back in the medieval times they didn't have the technology we have now, or even the technology that was available in the 17th century when it came to making strings for instruments such as the violin, but they still did have violins around, so how? Well, in comes the invention of cat gut, which thankfully is not made of cat guts, but it is made of sheep's guts. Okay? really had you in the first half there. Violin string makers during this time would make the strings by basically twisting strands of sheep innards together. Their job would require them to butcher the animal in a very careful way, making sure not to rupture the stomach or the lower intestines. The process could take hours just to get the required materials from the animal. The insides then needed to be soaked in a wood ash solution for a good cleaning, but they needed to be monitored 
at all times to ensure that they weren't beginning to spoil, which is horrible. From here, the drying process began, and after that, it was time for twisting. In our number three spot today, we have the rat catcher. Another job that really is just what it sounds like. Rat catchers had quite a busy time during the medieval times. There was a rat problem, and these rats were filthy and full of disease, and someone needed to catch them. Castles were often filled with extra grain, vegetables, and herbs in the case of emergency, and this led to the perfect environment for rats and mice. Even before the connections were drawn between rats and disease, people hated them, and this is because they would eat your food. A bad rat infestation for a person without much actually could have been a death sentence for them during this time. This meant that people really appreciated rat catchers in society, although the job wasn't a great one, was clearly risky, and also was largely ineffective. Rat catchers would sometimes try and use spells, sometimes they would use herbs as a sort of poison, and sometimes they'd even use the good old leave the body as a warning to the other rats trick. Yeah, wonder why it didn't work. In our number two spot today, we have the treadmill operator. This is a job that sucked during the medieval times because it was boring, it's basically like a human hamster wheel, but also because it was incredibly dangerous and not for those who were afraid of heights. Treadmill operators would normally be placed at the highest point of a structure, and the wheel they were stepping on was the top half of like a pulley system to help things be hoisted up as they were building said, you know, structure that they're at the top of. This is a practice that started in ancient Rome and was reintroduced in the Middle Ages. This was actually a job that was commonly given to people who were blind because the fear of heights dissuaded a lot of people from doing this job, which only makes it probably more dangerous. In our number one spot today, we have the lime burner. Lime mortar has been a common and important building material for years, stemming back to the first century BC, but despite its importance, it's not exactly easy to work with. In order to use it, you need to remove the carbon monoxide from the calcium rich stone, and this was the job of a lime burner. They needed to take the stone and heat it in a kiln at around 800 degrees Celsius. Sounds easy enough, for sure, except for the fact that the job meant that you were constantly being exposed to rooms full of carbon monoxide and dust chalk that was capable of removing your ability to breathe. And also, just to top it all off, there's also a high risk that once the stone was done heating, it might also explode if it comes into contact with water. So. Better hope none of your sweat drips down onto it or else things are not good. Kicking off our list at number 10, the London Tornado. We've all heard about the Great Fire of London in 1666. So let's talk about another horrible event from history, shall we? That's why I'm here after all. On October 16th, 1091, harsh winds from the Southwest took out more than 600 houses and a handful of churches. There was a mighty tornado. The Church of St. Mary was a rather unholy place to be on that specific day. The tornado killed two men in this building and it tore up the roof and timbers went everywhere. The rafters were actually ripped from the structure then slammed down far away back into the earth. Turns out historically about half of these rafters were buried in the dirt. That's how much force was thrashing them about. Tornadoes are so scary. I feel a strong wind outside and I'm immediately back inside, that's it. I'm shaking in my boots. I don't mess with wind. Number nine, the great drowning of men. Such a tragic name, my lord. How about we take out the word great and all these references maybe, I don't know, it's kind of horrible. In the Middle Ages, coastal areas around the North Sea were hot spots for flooding. Now historically, there were numerous reports of flooding here and for some reason, between the 11th and 15th centuries, this area would get absolutely destroyed. It would get completely swamped. And it's even larger than you can possibly imagine. The St. Marcellus flood took place on January 16th, 1362. Now the death toll here, I mean, obviously it's impossible to tell for sure, but historians believe it was at least 25,000 people. That's horrible. Atlantic gales were to blame for the rush of water because this event also goes hand in hand with the great wind of 1362. The great wind, awesome. The mighty wind, like it's not great at all. It's not really good. Number eight, one name. This next one here blows my mind. I never really thought about this before, but what was it like before we had surnames. Surnames were introduced to us in England in 1066, but before then, well, you were just Greg, period. That's it. There was another Greg, well, that was it. Now you guys had to fight till the death. No, I'm just kidding. At first, surnames were a little bit different. They were descriptions, almost, about the person you were meeting. So you'd meet a guy and he would say, hey, I'm Greg Red. 
Red signified his red hair. Makes sense. Greg Red, Greg Gray, he's getting a little old. Got it, Gregs, we're good. But the best part, your name could actually change over time because your description and then your appearance would also change. So one day you would meet Greg Red, but eventually his hair would fall out, he would age, then get stressed because, you know, he's living in the medieval times and all. And then once that happens, your name would change to match your new description. Now you're Greg Ball. Ball back then meant bald in Middle English, so everyone had the last name Ball. Isn't that amazing? Next video, I'll be Taylor Ball. I'll just be bald. Why not? Just change it up like Heisenberg. Number seven, medieval meals. Ah, yes. I hope you're eating while you're watching this. If so, give it a thumbs up, take a big bite, and good luck. Seeing as the holidays just passed, I figured there's no better time to mention a medieval holiday tradition. I'm glad we don't do this one anymore. This one's pretty gross. Swans today, they're beautiful. We see them traveling in pairs, and we don't hunt them down because, well, that would be insane, right? Medieval days, swans were hot property. They were a delicacy of the upper classes. Christmas swan pot. Nice, here you go, for you and yours. Enjoy, Merry Christmas. I would be crying on Christmas Day if I saw this on the table. They would actually stuff swans with beef, which I personally don't recommend. Turkeys, I'm like, okay, that we've dealt with. Swans, I'm like, no, but they're in love. They mate for life. Do we eat both? Let's eat both, I guess. Other medieval meals included peacocks, cranes, turtle doves, sparrows, and herons. Herons? Imagine Christmas dinner is a heron lying on the table, you're like, Really, Dad? I don't really want to eat this. This is a long, the long neck. Number six, the dancing plague. Okay, summer 1518, a summer we will never forget, sadly. One of the most bizarre events in medieval history, the dancing plague. The town of Strasbourg was calm, cool, and or collect until out of nowhere, one woman began to dance dance uncontrollably in the streets. She was convulsing, it was wild, but then soon others joined in and eventually there were over 400 people dancing their days away. Now it sounds funny in some degree, but it's really tragic. This was not a good time at all. A great amount lost their lives due to pure exhaustion and heart attacks and the authorities tried their best to help the situation so they paid for musicians to perform for them while they danced, while they were convulsing. They're like, oh yes, bring in a jazz band. Let's complete this image. This happened a few times in Europe, not just once. Between the 14th and the 17th centuries, we still don't know what exactly happened, but there were dance plagues. It was a common occurrence. All we know is that it was some sort of illness. It was not like step up. It wasn't a fun thing like step up at all. No one's just popping and locking in the streets. They're like, hey, nice. Let's bring in some music. This is great. No, people were very sick. They were very ill. Number five, Shroud of Turin. They say art is subjective, but what does the Shroud of Turin really show us here? Is it JC? Is it Jesus Christ himself? Many believe the cloth shows an image of Jesus when he was crucified. And once you see it, it's hard to argue otherwise. Hard to get out of your mind. Radio carbon and tests do date the cloth back to around 1260, and recent studies suggest that shroud was used in medieval church plays that would depict this exact scene, the resurrection of one Jesus Christ. What do you think? Accurate representation or another case of face pareidolia? Face pareidolia is when you see Jesus and things. I look at our producer Chris, I see Jesus every day right there. A little bit more Jack than Jesus, but you know, same image, more or less. Number four, summer is canceled. Back in 2013, scientists discovered a volcano on Lombok Island in Indonesia that went off sometime around May to October 1257. And scientists all agree that this eruption was the largest blast that the Earth had seen in 7,000 years. So it was quite a spectacle, a horrible spectacle. If that. Cut to the next year, 1258, the following cold temperatures ruined crops and brought famine to pretty much all of Europe. Cattle were all dying off quickly. It was far too cold for them to even stand a chance. And it's estimated that London saw 15,000 deaths that year alone. Experts believe that this volcanic eruption was a factor in the Little Ice Age that changed global temperatures from the 14th to 19th century. That's like if Yellowstone went off tomorrow. It would be a really bad time, and then well, afterwards would be almost worse, if anything. No resorts for a while, I think. Definitely not. Number three, the Great Famine. The medieval adjective game, back again with the Great Famine. Awesome, another great. All of Northern Europe suffered the Great Famine in 1315, so only like 60 years after that volcano went off. I mean like, what luck is that? What a terrible time to be alive. 1315 to 1317, two years of famine, countless lives were lost, and of course, with people losing hope, crime rate shot up to an extreme level. Can't even describe some of the things that were recorded, but my God, people were, Horribly insane. The Great Famine brought unrest in peasants, but it also disturbed members of nobility. It's always nice when that happens, right? It's not all of us suffering. Some of these noble purple lords up here are also starving. Cool, we're even. They were set back and in turn, they gave up the oath of chivalry. Yeah, talk about the dark ages. They're like, eh, you know what? 
No. Number two, Plague Bear. Bus boys, but for bodies. Let's do it. My God, this one's really dark. The hot summer of July 1665, right before London saw that great fire. What to do with all these poor souls who have been hit by the plague? Now, bodies at this point were literally starting to pile up. So we need a new profession, somebody that deals specifically with these horribly infected bodies. Any volunteers? Show of hands. Yep, we got one. Like a plague bear, for example. There we go, just what we need. A plague bear has your back and your front and all of your infected places. Church wardens would organize burials. This was a normal thing back in the 1600s, but when the plague hit, they had to change things up. If somebody had the plague, well, these plague bears, they, these brave souls, they would step up. They were the ones responsible for transporting all these bodies far, far, away, and then they would bury them, right? Just way over there. Great idea, honestly, the further the better. Couldn't agree more. A church would house these plagued souls away from society. Now, it sounds sad, but this was the best call, all things considered. So no, you weren't visiting any of your deceased loved ones anytime soon. And finally, number one, medieval punishment cleaner. This one really sucks. Best for last, here we go. Back in medieval times, many executions were public. The town would come out, watch a hanging or two, and then grab some bread and then head home. They're like, hey, classic Sunday. This was normal back in medieval days. Medieval punishments were like an event, but like modern events, somebody has to stick around and clean the place up. One of the earliest documented executioners goes back to 1202. He was the OG headsman. His name was Nicholas Johann, and their nickname was The Justice. The Justice. Are you kidding me? My palms are already sweating. Are you sure it wasn't the mountain? My God. Afterwards, this position spread through many capitals and large towns of Western Europe, and with them came the execution cleaners. Yeah, just a squeegee and a spray ball. They're like, hey, which table boss? Let's do this. Over his 36 years of ruling, King Henry VIII executed roughly 57,000 people. Yeah, welcome to the Middle Ages. Hope you like mopping. You're gonna be doing it a lot, like a lot, a lot. Number 10 is sumptuary laws, which are the most common kind of medieval law. Defined as laws made for the purpose of restraining luxury or extravagance, particularly against inordinate expenditures for apparel, food, furniture, and etc. Sumptuary laws were enacted for the purpose of regulating trade, but also regulate and reinforce social hierarchies by restricting foods, clothing, and luxury items. They did this so it was easy to identify someone's social rank and privilege in the name of good old fashioned social discrimination and class division. Bourgeoisie subjects appearing to be as wealthy or as wealthier than ruling nobility could undermine the royals' presentations as the most powerful in the land. Why, that could cause traitors and thieves and revolts. In late medieval cities, sumptuary laws were instituted as a way for nobility to limit the conspicuous consumption of everyone, most specifically the prosperous bourgeoisie, while still making it about poor commoners enough for it to slip past them while they were busy poking fun at those below them, they missed out what the royal sneakily did above them. Cowardice tax law is number nine. Medieval knights weren't always volunteers. In fact, a grand majority of many kingdoms functioned off of what was essentially a drafting of their men into the service. So it makes sense that not everyone was as passionate about the idea of sieges or holy crusades or anything that could really get them wiped out in the name of a cause that just wasn't for them. So while it could be considered a great honor to be called to battle and you wanted to shirk your duty of obligation, you technically were able to pay a scourge, aka the cowardice tax, which originated in 1100. Essentially a get out of jail free card that you paid for with your own wage, royalty started to lean into this new tax source and by the 13th century it had evolved into a generalized tax on the knight's land. When the scourge tax reached 300%, the result of one king's want to force those to serve him all in a total Icarus flies too close to the sun fashion, it led to the implementation of the Magna Carta which was forced onto royalty in the times to stunt their seemingly endless control and dictatorship. Sports banning is number eight. You've heard it in some of our other medieval videos, but we'll dive more into it now. Soccer and tennis were two banned sports of the medieval era. Handball, club ball, which is essentially baseball. Hand fighting, which we could call boxing, I guess. This law, which was made in 1485, was due to the belief that British men were losing their legendary archery skills, and also that these sports led to the sin of gambling. Obviously the rules didn't apply to royalty really, so tennis actually became an exclusively upper class sport for its etiquette, complex rules, and equipment requirements. Meanwhile, football, as you may already know, was absolutely brutal. There was violence leading up to deaths and serious injuries, and it was often played drunk and recklessly. In 1388, a national statute demanded that servants and laborers throughout the country stop.
stop playing football and other sports and practice archery instead, the latter being necessary for the defense of the realm. They reopened the law in 1410 to add the punishment of six days imprisonment for violating this rule. Even then, it was only enforced sporadically as royals were still depicted playing this game during the time of its illegality. Unlike others, this law obviously is not still in place today. This older legislation concerning unlawful games was repealed in 1845. Number seven says you're not for the streets if you do these things in them. There were a few smaller rules written in correlation with street behavior in medieval times. While it was okay to toss your feces just about anywhere, in 1839 a law imposed it be illegal to beat or shake any carpet or rug in the street. You can shake your doormat, however, but only before 8 a.m. in the morning. No carolers allowed then. It was illegal to sing songs and ballads in the street, especially if it was profane. And if you were to disturb the people by ringing doorbells or knocking on doors unexpectedly and unwantedly, you could be fined. Try enforcing that on Halloween. Meanwhile, in Scotland, it is still illegal to date to turn someone away if they knock at your door and ask to use your bathroom, no matter the time, place, age, or person. Spotted in a crowd is unfortunately number six. Why unfortunately? Well, another fun, sumptuary law, and one of the earliest ever made in Europe governed the appearance of minorities and social groups. Enacting laws stating specific dress codes for religions such as Jews or Muslims so that they were easily to be identified from other people. In English colonies, Muslims were told to wear a crescent shaped brooch or badge while Jews had to wear a similar badge as well as a ring and a yellow cone shaped hat. Yeah, I'd say that's pretty noticeable in a crowd. Alongside people who were Muslim or Jewish, the royals regulated laws of fashion towards people with certain diseases, those not following Christianity as a religion, orphans, and women of the night. Essentially, as you can tell, these were the unwanted peoples in the kingdom. So unfortunately, as mentioned, the point of these garbs was to make these people noticeable as social outcasts, so they may face mockery and degradation they didn't deserve for just simply existing. Number five is the Russian beard tax. All right, so this technically was just outside the realm of medieval times and into middle times, but in 1698, Russian Emperor Peter the Great placed a tax on beards, hoping to force men to adopt the clean shaven look that was common in Western Europe. Peter's goal was to shift Russia to an Eurocentric visual. His return from a two year escapade in Europe had him changing up the fashion trends as well, replacing their long familiar Russian overcoats with French or Hungarian style jackets. They were shorter in length. It meant anyone walking the streets in an old fashioned robe was liable to have it cut short by Peter's designated fashion inspectors. The same inspectors would approach any bearded man they saw, requesting to see his beard token, a silver coin with a leafed edge and in the center a mustache, nose and beard. This token was given to men who had paid their legally mandated beard tax for the year. No token provided when asked, doesn't matter if you forgot it at home, the inspectors would cut your beard off on the spot or simply rip it out of your face. The Russian Orthodox Church, which hated Peter the Great, saw this as a downright scandal as their teachings considered uncut facial hair a reflection of piety, seeing as man was created in the image of God, which included a beard. To shave it was a grave sin, but the church never really could stop Peter or his wily goals. This beard tax remained in place until 1772. Nowadays, these beard tokens are actually extremely rare collectibles, selling for as much as $10,000 in auctions today. Number four tells you don't mess with royal animals, whether it's eating them, hunting them, or breeding them. The royals had some rules for their medieval animals. First up is how in 1332 a statute passed established the king shall have throughout the realm whales and great sturgeons taken in the sea or elsewhere within the realm. In normal English terms what they're saying is any whales or sturgeons that were caught or washed up on crown ruled soil it had to first be offered to royalty before being pilfered. This law is actually still in place today but rarely ever actualized on. However in 2004 a fun Welsh fisherman diligently complied with the law by offering a sturgeon he had caught to the queen herself. She politely declined the offer. Interestingly enough, the provisions of this statute are expressly protected from repeal by the Wild Creatures and Forest Laws Act of 1971, as it ensures hunting these animals is minimized. Wanna offend a royal? No? Pay attention to your dog, as it's an offense to let your dog mate with any dog belonging to a royal family member. Queen Elizabeth II's corgis of modern day are included, as this law is also still valid now. There were animal laws that weren't just for royals, however, a law said that keeping a pigsty in front 
front of your home was illegal unless it was well hidden. You also weren't allowed to be in charge or ride horses and cows if you were intoxicated. The first drunk driving regulations. And as you may know, even animals could face the judge and jury in animal court for their crimes. Number three, we discuss how excessive food consumption led to restrictive laws on how food and drink were to be made, sold, and consumed. This is a great example of sumptuary laws from the point 10, where the royalty is irritated by blurring lines between them and the bourgeoisie. In 1309, Edward II criticized the outrageous and excessive multitude of meats and dishes that the nobles were eating, emulating the lifestyle of their superiors. So Edward III, in 1336, enacts a law that would have made his daddy proud. No man of whatever rank he shall be shall be served a meal with more than two courses, except for certain festivals such as Christmas, on which three courses were allowed. Edward III said that many mischiefs caused by the many sorts of costly meats which people in this realm had used was the reason for this decision. But seeing as commoners were practically starving to death at the time, it's obvious where this law was pointed. These laws may or may not have influenced the behavior, but there was no real evidence of any actual enforcement of them. So despite this, the statute wasn't repealed until 1856, but there was no proof of it being used. Scold, and no, not what your mom does when you don't clean your room, is number two. The word scold was used as a legal term for women who disturbed their peers or husbands' peace with quarreling, gossiping, slander, brawling, or even just talking too much. Imagine he left his socks on the floor again, you tell him to put them away, and boom, just like that, you're a scold. While being a scold wasn't a crime, it was criminally punishable, and they had quite a few imaginative and funky ways in which to do so, such as a scold's brittle, which is an iron cagelet or mouth that encases the mouth exterior and interior, ensuring that the woman's mouth opens or even her tongue moves, metal spikes would lacerate and puncture her. Sometimes they would even add insult to injury by parading the woman around town in the brittle to face scorn or by chaining her to a fireplace where she could inhale ash and soot and desperately try not to cough lest she gets the brittle spikes. There was also a yoke, a type of wooden restraint that could either hold one or two people. A woman could be married to wear one alone, sent walking for hours under the disproportionate weight as a punishment, or she might be locked up with the woman she was fighting with, in which case you don't have the discomfort of the weight, but you do have the discomfort of staring at your rival's ugly mug for a while. Doing the do and when to comes in at number one. In medieval times, there were numerous religious laws enacted that aimed to restrict the act of reproduction and the times in which it could be done. In a seven day week, a married couple could only engage four of the days. Thursday and Fridays were no no days as people were supposed to prepare for the Holy Communion, and Sunday as well because it was was the Lord's Day. In a year itself, the 47 to 62 days of Lent and then the 40 to 60 days of the Feast of Pentecost, relations were prohibited. For the 35 days leading up to Christmas, it was also banned. Anyways, medieval folks considered the eyes important in regards to a person's sexual appetite, so it was also encouraged not to make eye contact during banned periods with someone if you're attracted to them. That I can actually kind of get. It is a romance movie trope after all. Anyways, outside of a religious factor, abstinence during Lent ensured no babies would be born during winter time periods when food was scarce and it was harder to endure pregnancy. Slander is number 10. Imagine seeing some random dude in the market square holding his nose and shouting about how he was a liar. Honestly, wasn't weird under the Norman law from 1066 to 1154. If you committed the act of slander, on top of paying damages to those whose reputation you may have affected, you also had to do the holding of the nose. This law was enacted by Pouty, first king of Norman who had spent his whole life on the throne being called William the Bastard for his parents' unmarried status. In return, he exacted this silly law that required the slanderer to stand in the center of town, as previously described, holding their nose and shouting about their lies. Public humiliation has long since been an effective means of preventing crime. And just about anything. Number nine is Jenny cragging it. Edward III of England was so tired of his royal court and nobility being heavier set that he made an entire law about it. In 1336, the new law stated obesity made people not able to aid themselves nor their liege lord in times of need. Edward mandated a maximum belt size and also, if you watched part one, implemented food restrictions, banning more than two courses with the exception of holy days. Edward even defined soup as a separate course to prevent people from calling that a sauce or a condiment. This law lasted remarkably until 1856. Its main purpose in the long run had likely become beneficial economically to ensure that England's resources could be employed more effectively in the upcoming war with the French. Still, regardless, he seems like a fat shaming dude. German purity law is 
Number eight, beer is Germany's national drink, and that's nothing new. The Germans have been indulging for thousands of years. Typically, beer was produced in groups and always made of pure grain, until the purity laws made by Wilhelm IV in 1516 Bavaria. Germans, and most people of the medieval and middle ages, didn't drink water as it was often deeply contaminated. They drank beer. The law imposed was aimed at preventing crops used to make bread from being squandered on brewing, so it stipulates that only water, barley, and hops were allowed to be used as key ingredients for beer production. At first, brewers thought this was ludicrous and unusual to decide, but turns out Wilhelm was actually onto something with this combination. This original law went on to become the core of German beer purity laws that affect German brewing to this day, which makes them the oldest regulations related to food and drink in the world. The only change to it in recent history was the adding of yeast. The Brewers Association of Germany wants the 5th century old law governing how German beer is made to become part of the UNESCO World Heritage List. It would join the Argentinian tango, Iranian carpet weaving, and French gastronomy, among other famous traditions that are considered unique and worth protecting. Let's talk sumptuary laws with the Spanish garment laws, number 7 in the countdown. Sumptuary laws, which we discussed in part 1, are placed in to control the nobility and their consumption and displays of material goods. In the case of Spain, there are many sumptuary laws in place as early as the Spartan era. In the 13th century, for example, Siena passed a provision reducing the trains on women's dresses, which was a direct effort to curb a purely aristocratic style. In 1356, the city of Florence proclaimed it illegal for women to have buttons on their clothing without a corresponding buttonhole. And also, no one other than the king was illegally permitted to wear a scarlet rain cape. Also in Florence, it was studied how sumptuary legislation around fashion served as a tool to encourage marriage in a society where excessive extravagance of men providing clothing for the women and their families exasperated the custom of very expensive dowries. If her standards were already up, you had to work harder to pay for her, I guess. And a delay in marriage did mean a dip in population. While there are ample examples of the laws themselves, similar to many other sumptuary laws, there's virtually no record of their enforcements or punishments. Oftentimes, this is because nobility themselves violated their own laws that they made for themselves. Without evidence of how exactly these laws were enforced or whether they were enforced at all, it remains extremely difficult to discuss their social impact, the attitude civilians had towards them as well. Did they act accordingly so as not to face legal difficulties or the payment of fines? Who knows? Not us. So on to the next. Refusing knighthood comes in at number 6. This law was put into place in 1233. Why you may ask? Because simply put, being a knight sucked. If you saw our last video, you may remember hearing about how insanely taxed knights were, but on top of that you had to pay for a ton of mandatory clothes, train incessantly, pay the king for serving him, and don't forget the custom sized armor. You lose or gain weight, you're gonna have to pay to replace whole pieces. That's on top of the potential of dying in a battle you just don't care for. No, not many people wanted to be a knight. Roger of Dudley refused to attend his own knighting when he learned he'd have to pay for it. In response to his refusal, Henry III on the spot passed a law against refusing the knighthood. He forcefully knighted Dudley and also confiscated his land to boot. Yikes. Number 5 is the legal protection of claiming sanctuary. Disney's Hunchback of Notre Dame depicts an iconic scene of Quasimodo swinging around on rope dramatically over the burning base of the Notre. Having just saved Esmeralda from an execution, he holds her aloft in the cathedral's terrace and screams out sanctuary. Sanctuary actually predates Christianity and originates far back into the 300s and existed until the 16th century. Every medieval law folded to the protections of sanctuary no matter the criminal's crime. Now, sanctuary seeking criminals might have been required to perform penance or go into exile, but they were at least guaranteed immunity from punishment. That's right, you could literally strangle someone and then run to the church to claim sanctuary and no one could come in and harm, arrest, or remove you for punishment. Sanctuary was abolished due to the new tide of judicial law and the arguments of crime, power, and punishment. Also because people should be punished for, I don't know, maybe taking someone else's life. Originally, before Christianity, it was temples such as the ones in Greek and Rome offering the solace, and it was part of the Roman law by the end of the 4th century to have it. Christianity adopted this practice to try and persuade people to join their religion when it started. Even after the Western Roman Empire fell in 476, churches maintained their authority to protect people who had broken major secular laws. Number 4. Let's meet the Yellow Ladies Venice, Italy was an important trading post. Many people came and went, many travelers came to see the great city. But for those who had been at sea for a while, they may have wanted to see a little something else. As a result, medieval Venice was a massive red light district, enjoyed by many before their next voyages. Trying to control the number of ladies working the streets, 
states, the Venetian government mandated in 1360 that brothels must be concentrated in the market and port districts. Obviously that just made their industry boom more since it was concentrated right where all the money came in and not dispersed, requiring men to travel farther out in convenient ways. Angry now that they weren't at least getting to capitalize off the potential tax revenue of these women, they in 1420 decided to be accommodative of their lady of the night friends, the Venetian government accommodated more red light districts and implemented safety means within them, as well as the law of yellow. All women of the trade were to wear shades of yellow so as to be identifiable to their clientele, so random ladies just out on a stroll who happen to be in the area don't get harassed. But also it's a little bit of that classic shame tactic of making someone unwanted easily identifiable for discrimination. Number 3 is the indigenous sumptuaries of Spain. As early as 1501, the crown warned natives who carried sword, dagger, or any other weapons that they face confiscation and may be condemned to more punishments according to what the court sees fit. Spanish restrictions against natives developed through the 16th century. This mandate is no surprise as these items, while dangerous, complemented and enhanced men's fashions, and fashionable repairs became integral to everyday masculine attire in Europe. To the indigenous, they had been items of necessity to carry and often seen as symbolic. For indigenous men of the elite, the right to bear arms highlighted much more than their privileged status the way that it did for the colonizer. It demonstrated colonial acknowledgement of their once dominant standing on their original lands and partially vindicated their marginalized reality even as a royal. June 8, 1685, Don Diego Garcia, an indigenous leader of what's now Guerrero, had petitioned to the Viceroy of New Spain to intervene on his behalf when this sumptuary denied him the right his parents, grandparents, and ancestors had always possessed. Garcia was one of 505 petitions submitted by 277 towns between 1575 and 1693 demanding change. In response to a perceived disregard for the law, the monarchy reissued the restriction six more times over the course of the next 70 years. The items requested by Don Diego Garcia reflected both indigenous and European definitions of masculinity. By focusing on European attire and the personal weapons, Garcia took advantage of the social currency imposed by Spanish colonizers. As an elite, Garcia faced decreased political power and increased marginalization under a new regime. Garments and swords provided the ability to visually assert himself in everyday life. Ultimately, petitions submitted by Garcia and his peers reflected not just a request for special status items, but an attempt to assert their belonging as an elite man in a colonial life. Number two is just absurd, but you can club a Swede. If they cross the frozen sea between Denmark and Sweden. What? This unusual law was imposed during the Dano Swedish Wars of 1657 to 58. King Charles Gustav of Sweden had been planning to cross the Orsund by ship, but the freezing temperatures of January changed that plan. Frozen solid, the Swedes realized that they could simply just walk across. This completely caught the Danes off guard as no attack had been predicted until the spring and they scrambled to compensate. Ultimately, the Danes signed the Treaty of Roxgild and yielded to the territory dispute. But ever since that day, should you see a Swede crossing over the frozen sea on foot, you are legally free to swing a big old club at him. And finally, at number one, you either tuck it or you lose it. Medieval Wales was not playing around when it came to women being violated. If you were caught or perpetrator of this heinous crime, your options were to pay a dowry or get the little man chopped off. That's right, a violation such as this was actually considered a theft and was treated as such by the law. Should a perp pay the dowry, then legally the woman's virginity or body was restored in legal parameters. Can't or won't pay the fine? Well then, that was the end of down there for you. The reason for this, other than it being morally right, is that the fines and punishments hope to stop families from developing harmful feuds which would damage the wider society as a whole. This was not exclusive to Wales, however. This punishment shows up in the 1750s code of Constinian Marvodokat in Eastern Europe. It was not unheard of for women to also simply just take the law into their hands either. In a rural area of Shropshire near the Welsh border in 1405, Isabella Grawernus and her two daughters ambushed her attacker in a field, tied him up, and did the dreaded snip snip and stole his horses to boot. All three women were subsequently pardoned. Number 10. Trial by Jury The concept of trial by jury can be traced back to ancient Greece and Rome. Don't get me wrong, that's old school. But the first recorded use of a modern jury system that dates back to the 12th century England. Medieval England, yes, let's get some men in a room and point at witches. Henry II introduced the practice to replace previous methods of trial, which at that point was relying on physical combat or divine intervention, all that kind of like that. Under this new system, a group of 12 men from the community would be chosen to hear evidence and determine the guilt or innocence of said accused. 
right? A little better, a little, you know, less witchcraft, more, okay, we're all talking now, we're conversing. This system gradually spread throughout Europe and then beyond, so on, and Danforth, and it became an important cornerstone of many modern legal systems. Back in the day, this was a noble deed. It was an honor to be part of the jury, you know? Today, not, not really so much, not the same at all. You're like, what? No, I don't want to do that. It's gonna take so long. It's gonna be like four weeks of jury duty. I haven't done it yet. I've just jinxed myself. I'm gonna get called any day now. Don't answer, you know what I mean? Just don't answer your mail, don't look, just avoid it. That's what I do. Number nine, the stocks. All right, relax, stock bros. I'm not talking about those stocks. I'm talking medieval stocks. Those ones are a bit different. Those ones were very bad. Those are all bad. The stocks were a common form of punishment in medieval times. The convicted person's ankles were locked into these wooden boards with holes for their feet and stuff, and their hands were sometimes also restrained. We've seen this before. Usually people are like this. You go to a theme park, you pose with your family in one of these things, you're like, hey, I'm stuck. You're like, get me out, this is scary. They would be left in public spaces like that, such as the marketplace or town square, anywhere public because, why of course, you know, shame, shame, we gotta shame everyone back then. And if that wasn't bad enough, the accused would then be pelted with food or even physically attacked by the crowd. Imagine that, imagine being so sparse for food and you're like, yeah, let's throw our bread at that guy. It's like, what, what a waste, we need that. The duration of the punishment is varied, but it could range from a few hours to several days. Yeah, locked up like this for days at a time. What a joke. It was used for various crimes, theft, drunkenness, and slander. And it was intended to humiliate and shame the offender while also serving as a deterrent to others. Guys like, oh, I'd hate to be that guy over there. Yeah, for sure. All right, let's throw food at him now. Sick, so dumb, so dumb. Number eight, the drunkard's cloak. Yeah, this one's uh, quite funny. Not really, but we'll see. The drunkard's cloak, also known as the barrel or the shaming cloak, again, shame, shame, big important step back there. This is a humiliating punishment used in medieval times for people who were drunk or disorderly in public. This person, this drunk person, they were forced to wear a large barrel or a cloak made of wood or heavy cloth, something big and obvious with holes cut out for their heads and arms. Like they're a big mascot, a big barrel mascot in medieval times. And sometimes they would have offensive messages or images painted on it. You know what I mean? Like the piece of paper that says, kick me. That was like the old school version of that, much worse. The person would then be paraded through town in this garment, this outfit, this big barrel and not fun, often with crowds throwing garbage or food at them. You know, that kind of medieval Game of Thrones stuff. This punishment was intended to publicly shame the person as well, so yeah. Shame and then we'll go into the rough nitty gritty stuff at the end here. Number seven, eavesdropping. Eavesdropping back in the day. I mean, today we've all done it, right? We've all listened at some point in our lives to somebody we don't know. Every time I hear somebody in our hallway, in our apartment, I have to look, right? I'm like, who is it? Someone breaking in. But if you did it during the dark ages, if you listened in on a conversation you weren't supposed to hear, well, there were some serious consequences that were waiting for you. Eavesdropping was considered a serious crime back then. That's why they're always whispering in Game of Thrones. Now it makes sense, right? The act of secretly listening in on someone's conversation without their knowledge and or consent, while this crime was viewed as a breach of privacy and trust. <gasps> How dare thee? It was often associated with other crimes such as treason or espionage. This was a big bat. Espionage? Are you kidding? Just because you heard someone say something? Get out of here. Punishments here could include fines, public humiliation, classic, imprisonment, or... Yeah, remember what happened to Littlefinger in Game of Thrones? Not great, there's worse stuff that could be done. Yikes, horrible. Number six, Pacific hunting. Yeah, you gotta be sure which, uh, where you throw an arrow back then. In medieval England, the hunting of the king's deer was considered a very serious crime. Yeah, not that deer, that one's fine, but just don't you hit that one. Mm -mm. The act of killing or even injuring a deer was punished harshly under the royal forest law, which was enforced by the king's foresters. That'd be a cool job, just rolling through the forest looking for people. The law applied only to the king's forests, which were areas of land set aside specifically for hunting for his food. Violators could be subjected to a variety of punishments, including fines, imprisonments, and even mutilation. Yeah, a little different than public humiliation. It's just mutilation this time. This law was meant to preserve the deer population for the king's personal use and enjoyment, and served as a way for the monarchy to maintain control over the forest and the resources that it provided. So if you want food, go to that the forest over there. It's not even a forest, it's like a marsh. It's horrible. It's like three frogs left. Good luck. Number five, heretic's fork. Yeah, a lot like this. This one sucked. The medieval heretic's fork was a device used during the Inquisition to punish individuals accused of 
heresy. You hear the wrong stuff and then you say the wrong stuff, no matter what you do, bad punishment awaits. Some forks going in a place you don't want it to be. This punishment consisted of a long metal fork with two prongs that were placed under the chin and the sternum of the accused, making it so you had to stay upright or else, yeah, not good. The device was designed to keep the person awake and prevent them from speaking and or swallowing, and if they do so, it would cause extreme pain. The prongs here could be adjusted to vary the amount of pressure applied, and the device was often left in place for hours or, again, like the other punishment, even days at a time, which is horrible. The heretic's fork was cruel, and it was a form of psychological punishment that was used to extract confessions and punish those who dared to speak out against the church. Yes, how dare thee? Now hold still. Number four, sewer surfing. Uh, it's not as cool as you're imagining, but it's something along those lines. Also known as sewer hunting and or draining, sewer surfing was a popular but illegal activity during the Dark Ages. and involved navigating through the underground sewage systems of cities, typically for thievery or other illicit activities, trying to find some gold, something, I don't know, something shady going on under the city. Sewer surfing was often punished severely, more than you'd think here. Guys going through garbage, they're like, ah, hang him. It's like, what? What? It was also considered a violation of the law and a danger to public health. You go down there, you come back up with, I don't know, a plague that you found down there? You don't want that. You don't want a rat to bite you. Offenders would face fines, imprisonment, or even the gallows. However, despite the risks and penalties, many people, many people, continued to participate in this dangerous activity as it was their only means of survival or adventure, or money or goods or anything really. It led to numerous arrests and punishments throughout the medieval period. Honestly, Fair, I don't know, you never know. Somebody may have lost a nice pocket watch or maybe you'll find rats and then get really sick. 50-50. I found a pocket watch. Also, the town is violently ill, so I'm rich, sorry. Number three, blasphemy. Blasphemy! You almost have to yell it every time you say it, you know? Blasphemy was considered a serious crime in medieval times. It involved speaking ill or speaking contemptuously about God, Jesus, and or the church. That's a big no-no back then, big no-no. This was seen as a direct attack <laughs> a direct attack to God and the faith. It was considered a threat to the very fabric of society just because you said some shit. Blasphemers could be punished in various ways. At this point, you probably know them. Imprisonment, flogging, and or, well, yeah, just you're dead now. In some cases, offenders were forced to wear a blasphemer's bridle, which was a metal mask with a spike that was inserted into the offender's mouth, which would, of course, prevent them from speaking more. Blasphemy laws varied across different regions and periods throughout medieval European history, but they all shared a common goal of protecting the sanity of religious beliefs and shoving metal into a human's mouth. All those things were very important to the faith. It's good stuff. Number two, beard tax. I tried to grow a beard for like two weeks and I just, I just immediately bailed on the whole thing. I was like, hey, you'll see me guys, I'll show you. And then I came back, didn't even talk about it. In medieval times, I would have been fine. Honestly, this is a, it's a weird tax. There were periods and regions in medieval history where facial hair was regulated and or frowned upon. Imagine that, right? Guys trying to grow it out, a little, has a little stubble. Everyone's like, ugh. Really, Alexander the Seventh? Really? During the reign of Henry the Eighth in England, a beard tax, a beard tax, cha-ching, was imposed to well, only men with beards over two weeks old. They were required to pay. If you were day thirteen, they're like, "All right, we'll see you tomorrow. You better figure it out. Figure this whole thing out, Mister." Vikings, however, what about them? In the Dark Ages, Vikings—they were all about the beards. What happened? Beards. When it came to Vikings, they were highly valued and considered a sign of masculinity and strength. Again, I'd be screwed if it was that time. I'd be good over here, but then I'm a very weak man over here. Know what I mean? No tax, and then no muscle. Taylor McWaters, no tax and no muscle. Huh. And finally, number one, not reporting a dead body. Yeah, we've all seen Stand By Me. This can lead to some problems, some troublesome things. This last one here is pretty obvious in theory, but the way that they handled it back then was pretty crazy. We're not doing it the same today. Thank God. Thank the church and the lords. In medieval times, roughly around 1240, the law surrounding the discovery of a dead body, ha, huh, surprise, what's this? Who is this? This varied depending on the region and the time period. But generally, if somebody discovered a, huh, who is this uh, skeleton? What's this? Generally, at that time, they required to report it to the courts or the lords. The lords, you know the lords, go tell the lords. Failure to do so could result in punishment, as of course, it was considered suspicious behavior. Fair, okay, fair. More often than not, the person who found the body, they would be asked to provide information about the circumstances surrounding the death, including any and all possible suspects. Yeah, so, uh, Take a guess. He had wood teeth, he looked old and medieval. I don't know, he was someone. In some cases, the finder may have been entitled to a reward for discovering the body, but in other cases, you yourself
itself could be charged with the death. So 50-50, might get some money, might go to jail. If that was me, I'd be like, nope, I didn't see a thing, sir. I was just looking up at space, wondering what that big rock in the sky is. I don't know what gravity is. All women are witches, right, brother? Cheers, <laughs> didn't see anything. First up, since we've heard a decent bit about nights before, let's start with training day, or days, uh, well, years. The joke still landed, whatever. Training for nights began around age seven, and it would take an average of 14 years before they were ready to battle. Essentially like going to middle and high school today. And like the school system, you moved up through the levels. Potential knights started as pages, who essentially acted as an assistant or servant to their assigned lord. Most of the training for pages began practicing with dull weapons, learning to master riding a horse, take part in hunts, and otherwise do menial tasks. At 14, pages would become squires, assuming they were still in good physical health and not a raging socio or psychopath. According to medieval Britain, once a page became a squire, he had to master the seven points of agility, which was just a really long list of sporting events. So things like shooting, fencing, wrestling, riding horses, swimming and diving, climbing, long jumping, tournaments, sports like jousting, and dancing. Okay, so that's more than seven points of agility and dancing was in there, so let's just agree that medieval logic was a bit strange and their math skills were bad, and we can move on. After approximately five to seven years of this higher training, if they survived and had mastered all the required skills, they'd usually be officially knighted, and that's usually at age 19 to 22. You weren't taught to have your own opinions, but people are people, and that's why sometimes a knight had to battle their conscience. As a knight, you were serving God. But what did that mean? A knight could go his whole life without having the clouds overhead opening up and God sticking his head through to yell specific directions at him out of everyone on earth to choose from. So he had to turn elsewhere for guidance. Okay, so what do we got here? Well, there's, there's the priest, or you could ask the king, who by virtue was a direct mouthpiece of God, which by the way is super convenient to be packing when you want to do things like seduce courtiers or chop off people's heads. God said I could, ha ha. But this also means a knight is always beholden to kings and that mouthpiece of his. Whether or not the orders agreed with the knight's conscience, the orders came from God and he was dedicated to that God. So what happened to knights who disobeyed that or somehow dishonored themselves? The ones who the king hits up and said, yo, I'm gonna have your wife tonight or go execute this blind person for bumping into me. And their response was anything other than, oh yeah, 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 man, do whatever you want. Well, a king gave the knight his spurs so he could also take him away. According to noble dynasty, when a knight who did something treasonous or cowardly, let me uh, correct, was just accused of doing something treasonly or cowardly because there didn't have to be proof, he got publicly stripped of knighthood in a formal ceremony, then executed. And seeing as being a knight meant that could happen at any second, X marks the plot. There must have been those knights with existentialism, the ones who laid up at night wondering if all the infidel killing and pervy chivalry and pillaging and holy calling stuff, what if it's almost but not enough to get you into heaven? Which means you could do pretty much everything right as a knight and still spend sleepless nights worrying that you wouldn't make it past the pearly gates. They were a super religious lot after all. In anticipation of solving this problem, a lot of knights, well, those who made it past their youth anyway, would often join a military order because membership usually came with a plot in a church graveyard. And seeing as they believed even people who were completely without sin could not be guaranteed a place in heaven unless they were buried in a certain kind of dirt, that's better than a pension. And no, not any dirt would do. It had to be consecrated dirt of a church graveyard. According to ancient history, Cyclopedia, an aging knight would sometimes even enlist at the last possible second for battle so he could be interred beneath a lovely stone effigy in church forever without needing to do or spend any time doing boring churchy stuff. Our world loves class divide, and that's no different back then, when it sucked to be a poor knight. On that note, contrary to popular belief, not all knights were wealthy with castles and serfs and all that bougie middle age luxury. In fact, some weren't even landowners at all, and the rank of knight was more or less something that made one a minor noble, like your auntie on city council. Though, of course, many among the knighted held higher positions in nobility separate from their knightly status. This is to do with knight becoming a Nepo baby industry. The lowest class of these knights might even live in their lord's homes, serving more or less as bodyguards, security, occasionally law enforcement, and sometimes judges mediating local disputes. In essence, their day-to-day -day was a bit of a mashup between soldier and civil law enforcement. It's like the 
those people you met who wanted to become a cop for the fast action and the pew pew and the speed chases, then learn its 80% paperwork and painfully slow regiment. As you might imagine, lower ranked and poorer knights love tournaments for a chance to gain prestige, practice their skills, and the chance to acquire additional wealth via prizes and ransoms and the like. So tournaments is next on our list because they were essentially medieval mud melees. Since knights started at not nosed kids, it was easy to build the ideology of tournaments as fun and exciting into them, the foundation of competitiveness. In the 13th century, tournaments were particularly bloody and death was not uncommon. Initially, the games and tournaments were a little more than massive melees, usually including real sharpened weapons, there were no rules, and tensions were made intensely high because often they'd group the knights by nation or clan, then pit them against each other that way. Call whoever had that idea Taylor Swift because they wanted bad blood. That said, the general point, unlike real battle, was not to intentionally kill your opponent, but just to knock them off their horse, steal their armor and horse, and take them prisoner until the tourney is over. That being said, dull weapons weren't introduced into tournaments for hundreds of years, and they also used lances to launch each other off of horses at full speed, so realistically death is inevitable. One notable tournament took place in 1274 when King Edward I was pitted against the Count of Chalons. As the King and the Count battled it out, dozens of soldiers from each side got involved and lost their lives. And these tournaments often took up whole villages. This is because they weren't much different from actual battle, so knights could take off and hide in a peasant's house from the opposing team, which was often then ransacked and burnt. Essentially, being a medieval peasant was like living in Avengers Universe New York, where at any second your whole house could be obliterated in a blink and you miss it style by a group of battling morons. Losing your life can suck, but so can losing your gear, because knights buy their own armor. The biggest barrier to entry for those who are peasants or serf turned knight was the absurdly high cost of equipment. Remember, this was centuries before governments decide to arm their troops for combat. You want to be blessed by the divine right to be controlled by me, the king, your whole life and have no freedom, property, life, money, individualism of your own, only to die stupidly in a field somewhere? Well, you also need to buy your own armor. Being a knight was a fat ripoff. Mostly you were paid in land ownership or sometimes just by the glory of your lord. And that's because the system benefited noblemen who grew up in it. Not much different from how things work nowadays. So any armor or weapons you needed had to be purchased on the side. With money, you were never given. It's no problem for the knights of noble birth, but other knights would have to work the land and sell goods just to earn enough. Yes, it is also a tin can and it's one size only. Have fun rebuying pieces when weight fluctuates. One outlier though is new research and digital recreations show that knights were actually able to tumble, climb, chop wood, jump on horses, and run quite easily all in armor. So if you're scared of never being able to fit in again, never get out of it. Not like they washed much anyways. And while it can keep you safe, it can put a target on your back too. Held for ransom is next. And if you've ever watched a movie such as Gladiator, Braveheart, 300, Troy, to name a few, then you may recall that some dudes always wore special armor during battle, and some wore none. If you were rich enough or important enough, you could have the best of the best armor, made of the strongest but lightest materials to gain a defensive edge on the battlefield, all at the low, low price of your daddy's money. And it wasn't exclusive to any kingdom, so that means in one, oh, moment for everyone battling one another, knights realized that if they saw opponents in incredibly strong or elaborate armor, not to kill that guy, but keep him. Captured instead, a ransom could be demanded for a nobleman knight because only well-off knights wore such good armor, so that's what you get for flashing your stack, I guess. Worst case Ontario, if the ransom doesn't work out and none of your boys are a sizes 12 is 88s in tin seam, you can melt them down for some pieces of your own. Hey, what sucked more than the medieval knight? being married to one. Like so many of the sickest jobs in history, being a knight was exclusively reserved for the owners of a ding -a -ling. Their wives were expected to sit at home, not learning to kill people with a broadsword or pile driving her buddies into a pile of dung, their bloodlust going offensively unsatiated. Unless their husband died like a moron, that is. In that case, in a very un-middle ages twist, women were expected to fulfill all their husband's knightly duties. This included protecting their new lord and making sure his land didn't fall into disrepair. Only women didn't get any of the cool stuff that came with it, like respect or equality or acknowledgement by history. They got armor though, which is pretty sick. Unsurprisingly, the wives seldom waited for their husbands to get gored by a lance before getting all up in the business of running the show. He could literally drop at any time, so homegirl had to be ready. This resulted in knight wives 
actually being significantly more skilled and diplomatically inclined than their husbands. The duties generally expected of a knight's wife included everything from organizing the defenses of their state to arranging marriages for their servants. This was on top of being at beck and call for their husbands 24 hours a day. I wonder how many of these men really met their ends of their own accord, and how many met their end when she didn't need him anymore. It has the effect Taco Bell has on the average 21st century person. Dentistry. Dentistry is a disease caused by tainted food and drink, causing intestinal inflammation, leading to excessively frequent and uncontrollable diarrhea to the point of death. So yeah, Taco Bell. Generally, no one was safe. A fact 15th century Italian polemist Girolamo Savona, the Savonarola made clear when he observed that dentistry affected not only in the same house, but in the entire locale and moving from a child of 10 or 15 to a sexagenarian. Savonarola himself came down with the disease in 1495. Now this included knights. Battling knights. On English invasion of France, King Henry II had brought a well trained and disciplined army who were riddled with this disease. The tough tested veterans could handle the fever and the fatigue, but the constant loss of bowel control presented a massive, stinky problem on the eve of an already ominous battle. So, the English set up their position on one side of a narrow field, which lay between two forested areas. The narrow approach allowed the limited number of men at arms to stretch across the front, while the archers took stationary positions on the flanks, angled inward with a row of protective stakes in front. Thanks to their stationary positions, the archers suffering from dentistry simply dropped their pants and shot their arrows. They also dipped their arrows in it to add insult to injury as the world's worst psychological and bio-warfare duo. I mean, can you imagine an arrow covered in that flying at you? Yeah, they won. By a lot. And topping our list is a reminder that our mental well-being is not solely a thing of the present. It's PTSD. From crime statistics and letters of pardons, historians can see that people in the middle ages were no more violent than we are today. And yes, they exercised it in its most extreme forms, but this violence was not through nature nor culture, rather simple direction. Whilst following their orders, those battle experiences could leave them with a very serious case of PTSD. This is backed up by a book that was actually written by a knight who lived in the first half of the 14th century. His name was Girofi de Charny, and he was one of the most respected knights of his age. The book about the life of a knight actually includes the psychological consequences. These these symptoms ring true of PTSD. In his book, Dicharni advises knights on how to relate to the fact that they must kill people when they are at war, how to mentally endure the hardships knights face, poor sleep, hunger, emotional numbness, loneliness, and a feeling that even nature is going against them. Modern military psychology enables us to read medieval texts like these, or ones of Egypt or Greek battles, and the Mongols spread all in a new way, giving us insight into the perception of violence in the Middle Ages in the general population. In history, we've had a horrible habit of misinterpreting. Easy mistake as inflection doesn't appear on paper or stone or stone tablets. Previously, medieval texts were read as worshipping heroes and glorifying violence, but in the light of modern military psychology, we can see the mental cost to knights and of their participation in the gruesome and extreme violent wars in the Middle Ages, something that may be somewhat of a familiar career. So we're going to start with chariot riders. It goes without saying that people don't really remember that there's places outside of Europe when it comes to the medieval ages, and they never come up in conversation. The Bayezidine Empire had existed since 395, and it ended when the medieval era did in 1453. And one high-paced, action-packed, yet wildly dangerous job that was flexing the great wealth and progress of the empire was chariot racing, which differed from modern horse racing or even NASCAR racing. You were exposed, the chariots had no backs, and you were standing without any seat belts or restraints to keep you from flying off. You could be smashed against the stone pillars, dragged to your death behind your own horses. The appeal of racing for the fans appeared to be the same as the modern fans. Testosterone, adrenaline, bloodshed, and gambling. Racers, meanwhile, had the potential for a fortune and their freedom. Because that's what made the job suck, it's chariot riders weren't free men. And knowing you could win 15 bags of gold, uh, yeah, you're gonna kill any other racer who tries to get in your way. Because if you lose, you're just going back to hard labor. There were four teams in the Biazatine chariot racing. The white the greens, the blues, and the reds. Eventually these teams merged and it just became the greens and the blues and the fans were so passionate about the sport that, that when they weren't throwing nail studded tablets under the track to sabotage opponents, they were breaking into bloody brawls to support their own team. And now on the complete flip side, in primitive medieval Europe, a job called 
flatulist. As someone who reads and writes about history all day, every day, I really do have a hard time with how the Europeans got so high and mighty and dubbed everyone else primitive when they literally lived like it was the New Jersey's public landfill and had the humor to match. So yeah, believe it or not, royals would actually employ an individual called a flatulist to entertain crowds, sigh, by farting. These individuals would pass gas in what they called amusing manners, such as to music or even on certain cues to get big laughs. Irish gas performers were called brage tours instead of flatulists. St. Augustine, of all people, once wrote about flatulists, saying that they possess such a command of their bowels and can break wind continuously at will so as to produce the effect of singing. As if it could get more weirdly infuriating, some flatulists were actually considered celebrities of their time. One was Roland the Farter, who performed for Henry II's court annually. After several years, Henry rewarded him with 30 acres of land, a giant manor, for his skilled entertainment. Let's hear about how these old ladies would just you're healed. In ancient and medieval Europe, a group of wise women who were mostly elderly would give insight into medical issues primarily concerning the female body that the male counterparts had yet to grasp. And some of these homeopathic healers would actually spit on young ladies three times in order to protect them from the evil eye. Talk about a weird job, huh? This custom of spitting opens up a wide subject. Not only is it practiced in the hope of obtaining good fortune for the spit e, but amongst all ages and almost all people had been considered as an act to safeguard the spitter as well. According to Theocritius, amongst the ancient Greeks and Romans, the most common remedy against an invidious look was spitting. It was hence called despir malam. It is necessary to spit three times into the breast of the person who fears fascination. Invidious look and fascination is in reference to the evil eye. Old women were accustomed to avert the evil eye from children by spitting onto their own bosoms. And among the ancient Greeks, where this tradition even came from, it was customary to do the triple spit into your own bosom at the sight of someone with a condition or ailment you wish not to be stricken with. Leprosy, maybe they're a madman, maybe they're struggling with epilepsy. This act was done in defiance of the omen and spitting is known to be a sign of inversion, bidding it not come into their life as it had to the individual stricken with it. These spitting grannies were some of the first women hunted because they were believed to be evil sorceresses and witches. Because if farting was an entertainment, animal eviscerations were? Meet the bear leaders, an unusual historical profession involving exactly what the name describes, literally leading bears from village to village. Bears were mostly used for blood sports like bear baiting in which packs of dogs were set to fight against the bear. You can imagine how that go. Both Henry IV and Elizabeth I were famously fans of that horrific bloodshed and, by the Tudor era, increasing numbers of bear pits or bear gardens were constructed in major cities. Bear leaders allowed villagers to enjoy entertainment of the big city bear baiting fights in the comfort of their own homes. Incidentally, by the 18th century, the term bear leader actually came to refer to a different profession altogether. They were literally tutor and babysitter hybrids who were hired by parents to keep boisterous young noble sons under control and out of trouble, particularly during the Grand Tour. What's that mean? Taking care of crappy noble child was the same as handling bears. So let me think, leading bears from city to city making money in the medieval era, or raising a spoiled entitled child in an era where there's no water, washing the snot off their face or the stickiness off their fingers. Bear, bear, I'll take the bear. Can I get some bears over here? Bear, yeah. Here's one that's still a job to this day, adult adoptee. Japan's birth rate is probably worse than that of a nunnery, but they do have the second largest adoption rate, 90% of which is in between two adult Japanese men. This is often because the older man's employee or their pre-existing son-in-law, who could then agree per contract to take the name of his now sister wife, but they can be flexible negotiators in a sun search. For example, if the younger man still has his starter pack parents, the older man will happily offer those parents a buyout. If their new hand-picked son is already married, they'll also just adopt his wife as part of the package deal. Like most hardcore Japanese business practices, this weird form of feudal meritocracy can be traced back to the age of medieval samurai. For centuries, Japanese nobles would seek out competent young men to audition for who wants to be the next clan heir. And nowadays, major companies like Mitsubishi, Toyota, and Canon have actually been handed over to former CEOs adopted children.
children. The practice of using adoption to pick the next pater familias was also popular with the ancient Roman nobility. An example being the first proper emperor, Augustus aka Octavian. He was only a distant relative of Julius Caesar until he was adopted in the dead dictator's will to continue the hostile takeover of Rome. But the European practice of adult adoption existed and then was wiped out by the new feudal nobility during the medieval ages. Not because they wanted to create a more competitive market for baby orphans, after all how would the church get its free labor if not by people dropping them off on their steps. On the contrary, these Christian rulers banned adoption altogether, believing nobody deserves to be part of a good family unless they slid into that privilege on a wave of nepotism and discarded placenta. And speaking of Christianity, how about a church position called the Sluggard Wakers? Which is quite the name. Guess the only thing worse for the church's holy sanctuary than dangerous stray dogs was the presence of conked out parishioners. Sluggard Wakers were volunteers that patrolled the pews and ensured that none of the congregation was falling asleep when they should be praising their Lord. They were literally Jesus snitches. If you were caught dozing off during the service, the Sluggard Waker had the sacred duty to wallop you on the head. And not lightly. The sleeper you usually clobbered with something like a club, a rod, or a switch bundle. Some of the more aggressive sluggard wakers used forks or brass tip staffs or metal knobs to do the job. The sting of rebuke was supposed to wake you and remind you to remain awake and vigilant for your lord. Jesus wasn't sleeping on you, now is he? No. Some sluggard wakers were volunteer members of the congregation. Some wakers were members of the church staff, such as the parish clerk. Other wakers were also knock knobblers because when there were no dogs to drive off, there were likely congregants to wake up. I should probably explain all the dogs and church talk I'd be doing, so knock knobblers are next. Medieval Europeans lived in filth. Their structures all sucked and so did their economy. Does it really surprise you that the church would just have its doors wide open? Does it really surprise you if they didn't have windows? Of course animals can get in. So knock knobblers had the unique task of chasing wild dogs out of the church to protect the congregation, especially the priest who's most at risk while holding the full loaves of bread for service. Elderly men hold Holding warm loaves of bread were probably some very easy prey for a hungry, unscrupulous d wild dog. And as someone who survived being mauled by a dog, the terrifying reality is once they're on you, it can be incredibly difficult to get them off. So this job would actually be super necessary. Always remember, protect the face and neck. So a knobble knocker was given a whip and a pair of dog tongs. The whip was used just to scare the dogs away. The tong was used to clasp the animal from a safe distance so they could be removed from property. Their methods and ideology were the precursors to modern animal control departments and their tools. Knock knobblers didn't stop there though. If wild dogs weren't running around, they would instead turn their attention to unruly and disobedient children. If scolding didn't work, the knock knobbler would remove the child from service too. The amount of avoidable child screaming I've heard at a synagogue? Yo, I feel like we should just bring this back. I love this job. Before the phone book, the pocket book, a blackberry, or even gasp apple was the nomenclator. We all know the person or are the person who cannot remember names or or dates to save their literal life. If that is the case, you'd be better suited hiring one of these guys rather than working as one. Nomenclotters were serfs tasked with remembering other people's names, status, and important impressive details for their lords at public events. This way you aren't carrying a quill and parchment around for reference, and imagine how much more impressive it is to, for the fair damsels that you remember her address and her father's companies just like that. Or well, at least the dude standing next to you does for you, but whatever. Sometimes the nomenclotter's job would be hiked up a notch and they would have to remember more information for their master because homeboy got drunk or zooted. This could be details from prior conversations, plans to meet someone somewhere, things they've lied about and now you have to upkeep for them. Even just basic information about the individuals your master has been speaking to throughout the evening. Essentially, Norman Clatters were phone books before it was cool and embarrassment prevention babysitters. No better thing to title it, so let's just call it by its name, Piss Prophet. The Piss Prophet, also called a water scryger because oh, Oh, that's so much better, was a doctor who diagnosed disease from the sight, smell, and taste of a patient's urine. This term seems to originate from the 1600s, but the profession itself dates back to the medieval era. Now I gotta play devil's advocate a little bit because scientifically this isn't quite as insane as it sounds. Some conditions can really be diagnosed with urine alone, such as diabetes, which makes urine sweet. And as we would all know, dehydration causes strong dark colored urine, and UTIs can leave blood in urine. If you and I can recognize at least two of those things from sight without our doctor present, it's not totally gross that they give it a little dip and a lick. 
<laughs> and now we are cutting the crossroads. Hey, so want to hear a fun sentence? Samurai sometimes tested swords by attacking random passerbys. Yeah, so in medieval Japan, it was considered dishonorable if a samurai sword couldn't cut through an opponent's body in one stroke. It was important then for a samurai to know about the quality of his weapon, so every new sword he got had to be tested before he took into battle. Naturally, it's got to be a realistic test too. So samurai mostly practice this through and through cut style on corpses or on criminals. That's normal, kind of what you would expect, but corpses need to be whole in their culture, so not many people wanted to just offer theirs up for the chop chop. And well, Japan has has some efficient execution methods that were a lot more painful and slow for the criminals and taught the public a lot more. So you would never guess what the method was lined up to fill that void instead and somehow legally approved, condoned, and excused as a ceremonial way to go. Sujigiri translated means crossroad killing because the targets were random everyday commoners who were minding their own business and happened to need to walk through an intersection at night the way that we all do at some point. And samurai would quite literally chop these people down. Bodies would be found by others or in the early morning and there was never anyone to blame and you technically couldn't be angry or seek revenge. This was government approved and sanctioned activity. Incidents of sujigiri were rare in the early medieval period but began to pick up in the 1200s when more sociopathic or psychopathic samurai started to, pun intended, overkill it. By the warring states period, the end of the medieval area, sujigiri became a dishonorable act. Samurai and kabuki mo Ono rogues turned into a horrific popular pastime. In fact, one Edo era report from the year 1600 details the early years of the period, claiming that people were killed in Tsujigiri every night on certain crossroads in what's now modern day Tokyo. This continued to escalate, so the authorities felt they had to ban it in 1602, only a few decades after the medieval period finally ended. Starting our list off at number 10 natural disasters. We'll begin with the Great Flood of 1607, because, eh. Why not? This flood was a catastrophic event that affected the southwestern coast of England. Now, the flood occurred during the night of January 30th, 1607. Happy New Year, I guess. Let's all run for our lives. And it was caused by a combination of heavy rain and high tides. This, in turn, caused floodwaters to rise up several meters and destroying villages, crops, livestock, and sadly, claimed the lives of roughly 2,000 people. Sounds pretty tragic, but believe me, this is number 10. Yeah, it only gets worse right after this. Turn the clock back a few hundred years to the Great Storm of 1362. As its name suggests, this too was a massive storm that hit northern Europe, of course causing widespread flooding and destruction. It was one of the most destructive natural disasters in recorded history, with an estimated 25,000 people losing their lives. Sounds bad for number 10, but honestly, the lives lost it just gets bigger and bigger as the list goes, believe it or not. Number 9. Medical care or lack thereof. In medieval England, medical care was limited and often um, ineffective. Yeah, nothing really worked that well because they didn't know what was happening, right? Instead of cavities, they thought you had worms crawling around in your teeth. Good old tooth worms. Knock that out with a rusty hammer. Knowledge was limited, physicians were expensive and mostly treated wealthy patients at the time, while the peasants over here, us peasants eating bread, rotten dry bread breaking our teeth, well, we got the barber surgeons who performed basic surgeries and bloodletting. That's about it, it's all they did. You walked in, you're walking out lightheaded. You're gonna faint immediately. They were a barber slash dentist slash surgeon? What? You already know you're screwed when you see that resume. Herbal remedies and charms were commonly used because, well, that's all they had, and the church played a significant role in healing practices. Aside from that, not much left. You're, yeah, you're SOL, my friend. Hospitals were established to care for the sick, but conditions were often unsanitary and going there led to the spread of disease rather than curing anything. Medical knowledge, again, was so limited and many diseases and injuries were untreatable, leading to a high mortality rate that we're gonna talk about a bit later. Ooh, it gets worse, it gets worse. Number eight, punishments. The pillory was a device that consisted of a wooden framework with holes for the head and the hands. Offenders were placed in the pillory while they were publicly exposed and sometimes pelted with rotten food and or hard objects. Sounds pretty nasty. The whipping post is exactly what you would imagine. A wooden post to which offenders were bound to and then of course they were whipped with a whip or a rod. This punishment was often used for minor offenses, believe it or not. Uh, yeah, it gets worse. The ducking stool was a chair attached to a long pole that was used to dunk offenders in water, often in a pond or a river, dirty river, you get an ear infection in that one for sure. 
It was used to punish scolds and nagging wives. Yeah, bring on your nagging wives. We'll just take them for a dip, I guess. Your arms are gonna be jacked by the end of it. The brank, this was a metal mask that was placed over the head of the offender with a sharp piece of metal, and then that metal would go in your mouth and prevent you from talking. It's like a saw trap. As I was describing it, I was freaking myself out just then. This punishment was often used for gossipers. Yeah, again, these were all minor offenses, all things considered. Today, you get a slap on the wrist. Back then, you get rotten food hucked at you. What? Number seven, poor sanitation. Yeah, you're gonna wash your hands many a times in medieval England. Oh boy, sing happy birthday thrice. How does that sound? Sanitation during medieval England was very poor and resulted in widespread diseases and epidemics. Thought today was yucky, eh, way worse. There was a lack of understanding of hygiene and the connection between poor sanitation and illness. Waste and sewage were commonly disposed of in the streets, just hey, why not, what up? Or it was dumped in the Thames, leading to a high concentration of filth and contaminants which I'll talk, I'll talk about that more later. That's a really bad day happens with that river. Public bathhouses were both used for bathing and toilets. So pick which side you're gonna use accordingly. Better, better be confident which side you're going into. This of course led to the increase of diseases being spread. The lack of proper waste management also attracted rats and other vermin, which again carried fleas and other diseases. So it was just a big bad circle. The Great Stink of London. This one here was a major environmental crisis. It was a crisis, a stinky crisis that occurred in the summer the hot summer of 1858. The River Thames, which flowed through the heart of the city, well, this was heavily polluted with raw sewage and industrial waste, and the stench was so bad, Parliament had to suspend its sessions. Number six, lot of rats. Yep, watch your feet, it's medieval England, they're gonna bite ya. Imagine you're with your friends and family, you know, gathering around a table, eating bread, drinking ale, gathered around one candle, telling tales, good old medieval times, then all of a sudden you feel a tickle on your leg, what could that be? Be a shame if, I don't know, hundreds of rats began to swarm your feet out of nowhere. Yeah, welcome to the Dark Ages. This happened. Rats would come out of nowhere and it would suck. Then you have the plague. The plague rolled, or crawled rather, into medieval times back in 1328. And it lasted until 1350. That is a very long time to be stuck with plague rats. It was actually horrible. Don't get me wrong, our plague sucked. That was a lousy few years, no doubt about it. You know, a lot of Ozark, a lot of Netflix, a lot of time off. But I sure as hell didn't see any random swarms of black rats. Did you? Maybe, I don't know, where were you? The European population was reduced by a third and rats were the main cause of spreading. Yeah, way to go guys, you nailed it. Ratatouille, Stuart Little, all you guys planning your little rat attacks, nasty, you're all nasty. No franchises for either of you, no more. These hairy balls of yuck pass it on to everybody. We gotta move on before I throw up. Number five, superstition. Ah uh, yes, here we go, this one's good. In the medieval era, cats were often associated with witchcraft, because of course, look at them, right? so evil. The church, which held great power during the medieval period, condemned cats as a symbol of paganism and the devil, of course leading to widespread persecution. However, the rapid decline of cats led to a significant increase in that rodent population. Yeah, remember those fun balls of fur that I just mentioned? That's where this all started, because of evil devil cats. It was our fault the whole time. Who would have thought? The condemning of cats led to a surge in a number of rats and mice that carried diseases. King Edgar the Peaceful, so peaceful, we know him. He reigned from 959 to 975. He issued a law in the 10th century that set a value on cats and imposed fines on anyone who harmed or killed them. Now we're talking, now we're getting back into the nice peaceful, the peaceful, I mean, come on. The law was intended to encourage the breeding and keeping of cats as they were now seen as valuable for controlling the rodent population that threatened crops, food supplies, and um, us. We matter as well, I guess, humans. Number four, law and order. Misuse of weights and measures. Yes, false advertising back in New Olden days. Let's talk about this. How did you sell stuff without, you know, getting caught? Medieval merchants were required to use standard weights and measures when selling goods, right? That's protocol. And those who tried to cheat by using inaccurate measures or weights could face some brutal penalties. I saw a video of some expert fisher and he's putting weights in a fish's mouth. He's trying to cheat his way through a fishing tournament. He got caught. It was on Reddit. It was so funny. But like back in the medieval times, he would have been screwed. Fraudulent begging as well. We've seen this on Reddit at some point. Begging was a common practice in medieval times, but those who were caught faking a disability or pretending to be in dire times, well, then they could be punished with public humiliation or even physical mutilation. They rhyme, but they're very different things, those two. Eavesdropping as well, one of my favorite things to do of all time. Love listening in on things, right? Listening in on somebody else's conversation is great, but back in the dark ages, this was considered a serious crime. And those who were caught listening, hmm, what's that? They could be fined or imprisoned, and in some cases, eavesdropping was seen as a form of treason, since it could be used to gather information that could be used against the state. So sometimes, yeah, real bad. You don't want to hear the wrong thing, or else they would, you know, gallows. You hear? 
Mm -mm. Gallows. Number three, health plan? Yeah, question mark, because yeah, here we go. During medieval England, the average life expectancy was around 30 to 35 years, with many people biting the bullet to poor nutrition, lack of sanitation, infectious diseases, and rats everywhere. Ugh. Living conditions sucked, limited medical knowledge was all you had, and Frequent wars and famines were always rolling around, so yeah, all that in 30 years or less. How fun. Common illnesses included respiratory infection, dysentery, and tuberculosis. Medical treatments weren't great at the time, of course. There was a, a lot of prayers, that's for sure. That's a lot of people relied on those. Dark Age medical treatments included herbal remedies, bloodletting, and surgical procedures performed all without anesthesia. So you're gonna feel every Wrong move to say that. However, there was also some advancements in medicine during this time. It wasn't all bad, including the founding of hospitals and the use of quarantine to prevent further spread of disease. How fun is that? Imagine being the first person to think of a quarantine. You're like, hey you, no, go over there. How does that sound? Yeah, we're doing something right now, trust me. Number two, war. What is it good for, you know? In the Middle Ages, this was a time of frequent warfare in Europe. This was due to various factors, such as the rise of feudalism, religious conflicts, and territorial disputes, all those good things. One of the most significant was the Hundred Years' War, which began in 1337 and lasted, well, as you could guess, until 1453. Yeah, it wasn't quite, it was a hundred and a bit, but you know, sounds cool if we say it like that. It was fought between England and France over control of territory in France. The war saw significant battles, such as the Battle of Agincourt and the Siege of Orleans, and it had a profound impact on both countries. Another notable medieval war, you probably heard of this one, the Crusades. Yeah, that one for sure. The Crusades were a series of religious wars fought between the Christian nations of Europe and Muslim nations of the Middle East. Now the Crusades began in 1096 and lasted until the late 13th century with varying degrees of success and failure from both sides, to say the least. A lot of deaths, a lot of, a lot of warfare, a lot of horribleness, horrible ways to go. And finally, number one, plagues. The well known of these plagues back then was the Black Black Death, which, I mean, scary name, but yeah, it's pretty much nailed it. The Black Death first appeared in the mid-14th century and killed an estimated 25 million people in Europe, or at that point, one third of the population. Yersinia pestis bacterium was spread by fleas that infested rats. Again, so awful. Other medieval plagues include the Justinian Plague, which struck the Byzantine Empire in the 6th century and killed an estimated 25 million people, and the Plague of Athens, which hit, well, Athens during the Peloponnesian War in the 5th century BC. Another deadly outbreak during the medieval period was the Great Plague of Marseille in 1720, killed 100,000 people in France. While it's one thing to live life through a plague like we have done, we can be glad that it's not like these ones because they lasted much longer. And like I mentioned earlier, um, I don't f with rats, so yeah, this one seems a little more calm near the toes. That's always great, love that. Such as the forbidden omelet. It's not really an omelet actually, it's more like if you cut a pancake-like slab out of the color canary yellow. Back in medieval times, Lent and the other billion days they spent fasting were a miserable affair where Christians ate like lentils and dried fish every day for a month. The English came up with a solution for this tiresome diet, the tansy. A sweet and savory dish that was somewhere between a pancake and a vegan omelet. Tansy took their name from the Tantatum vulgare herb that grew across the country at that time in great abundance. Eventually a lot more ingredients were added to tansy such as parsley, feverfew, almonds, breadcrumbs, nutmeg, cream, and butter. Ironically, despite the love of tansies and the fact this plant was used to treat medical ailments, it was later discovered to be poisonous. Dangerous to consume, rub on skin, the whole nine yards of poison. Hilariously, that did not stop the English from quite literally driving it to extinction. No more tansies now. And what could possibly be more tasty than something that you can make laxatives out of, perfume, and car oil? It's whale vomit. Ambergris is often considered as one of the world's strangest natural occurrences, and it's been used as an ingredient in food and drink alone for hundreds of years. Europeans used ambergris as medication for headaches, colds, epilepsy, and other ailments. The first reported use of ambergris in perfumery comes from Muslim Spain. It has been used for flavoring everything from cigarettes to Turkish coffee and even hot chocolate. If you like the TV show Bob's Burgers, you may know it from their episode titled as such, where the kids find a big old chunk of it washed up ashore in their wharf town. Something that does still happen nowadays, so keep your eye out for what looks
looks like a giant chunk of earwax at the beach. Formed in the intestinal tracts of sperm whales over decades, amber grease is a grayish brown waxy substance that some scientists believe is produced by whales to help ease the passage of objects they have eaten that they can't digest before expelling the same way whales expel fecal waste. Usually found floating in the sea or washed up on beaches, amber grease has not only been the foodstuff of choice for royalty, but it's also been a firm favorite of the perfume industry even today thanks to its strong and lingering scent. Nowadays, amber grease has fallen out of favor as a food additive, possibly because people found out what it does and where it came from, but it's still used in the perfume industry apart from in countries where it's banned, such as Australia and the United States. Another absolutely bizarre natural occurrence they enjoyed was the open ours. The rudest entry on this list by Country Mile. Open arses were actually a commonly consumed variety of apple in medieval ages, and they do not look appetizing. What is that? It looks like a Photoshop project of a potato, persimmon, and a crab apple put together. I would say don't judge a book by its cover, but the inside is an effing mess too. Look at that. Who thought that was edible? Who said look that looks tasty? Give me a bite. Literally has the composition of a moldy peach. According to the interwebs, the apple got its rather vulgar nickname from its appearance of the underside. The calces, which normally look like this on an apple, are very large and they're spread apart on an open arse, giving the underside of an apple a distinctly certain exit human appearance. Somehow, looking like that and being still called an open arse, the apple managed to pick up popularity in the 13th century and remain popular for cooking well into the 17th. Dying of fever or just in the mood for an inconvenient hard to cook dish, well you may want to consider roast rodent. Those little roly polies, hedgehogs were considered a cure for everything from sore throat to leprosy. Their fat and intestines were considered the most viable. Hedgehogs may seem like an unlikely source of nourishment for us today, not just because of their prickly spines, yet their quills didn't deter determined chefs of the past globally, especially in medieval times when they prepared roasted hedgehogs by gutting and trussing them just like pullets. The hedgehogs were then roasted and then only after they were pressed in a towel to dry and served with cameline sauce or wrapped in pastry and then broiled again. A piece of advice, if, if you're trying to roast a hedgehog and it refuses to unroll, simply take the dead body and put it in hot water. Or at least that's what the recipe books say. It's gross now, it was gross then, but hell do we love it, it's fast food. Stopping for a few minutes to pick up a meat pie for lunch was as common as hitting the drive through today and just as likely to give you diarrhea. Just back then, diarrhea would probably kill you. Fast food cooks were notorious for using diseased or undercooked meat or just warming up yesterday's spoiled leftovers. Again, not very different from what goes on at the back of Taco Hell or Taco Bell. Fast foods of London of the late 13th and early 14th century contained easy, portable foods much like today's Big Mac. Meat pies, hotcakes, tansies, and wafers. These meat pies, called umble pies, consisted of edible entrails from deer or wild animals, generally just scrap meat. These cook shops functioned like medieval drive throughs where customers walked up and put an order at the window. The food was being mass prepared, then individually produced. They toss your little pie in the flames right there, pull her out a second later, and there you go, enjoy your entrails and wheat. In many urban areas, one street became known as the fast food capital for the city. In Bristol, Cook's Row catered to the customers looking for fast, tasty food. As a result of these innovative fast food kitchens, professional cook emerged during the medieval period, employed at the great estates and in smaller shops of urban centers. So they colonized half the world for spices, but aren't the best at using them. It's sugar and spice and not so nice sauce. Spices were stupid expensive because Western Europe isn't exactly known for fiery flora or flavorful plants. And the only real means of transportation tended to die if you rode them too far, horses. So obviously you're just getting rare bits of dried herb brought back from crusades that you also have no idea what it is or how to use. And that's only if you're wealthy too. A lot of recipes described the peasants and even the wealthy seasonings as vinegar, ginger, garlic, chopped bread, unripe apples, and almond milks. AKA most people were limited to flavoring their foods with whatever BS they had lying around. Mostly the tart or sour, leading to the modern British tradition of refusing to eat food that actually tastes like anything. Like spices, sugar was so expensive that it blackened rotten teeth became a status symbol. It was so coveted that when it finally became cheaper and more accessible to the average person in the 16th century, people went nuts. They were rolling meat in it, vegetables, and probably themselves. People tried to lie.
liven up their bland ass food with sauces, but the limited access to dairy and tomatoes were still a twinkle in the eyes of the colonizers. And these sauces, they weren't the sort of thing you'd want to dip your pizza rolls in as a result. At the beginning of the medieval period, sauces were based on milk or wine or butter, or simply the au jus which emerged as part of the cooking process. Because bread was so important to the overall caloric intake and to maintaining the consistent mold and food poisoning that was killing them all, flour could not be wasted to prepare sauces and gravies, except on the tables of the rich. Their sauces were more like oatmeal, which you'd only serve on vegetables today if you want to ruin them. To give you an idea, one sauce is gruel, it's pounded oatmeal mixed with broth. Oh man, what a treat. Next up is beaver tails, but not the bannock type. Usually saying beaver tail, you think of that sweet, fluffy fried dough covered in sugar, maybe ice cream that's found at carnivals or amusement parks, or that hometown restaurant that sells them for $6.50 even though they're the size of your head. But medieval beaver tail? Whole different animal. Wait, well, whatever. Anyways, as discussed, medieval peasants were fasting like three fourths of the year. That's a long time. So the church compromised by simply forbidding people to eat meat during fasting holidays and then compromised further by agreeing fish isn't meat. But why stop there? People went even further by deciding certain parts of animals found in water that kind of looked like a fish, like a beaver's tail, counted as fish. Beaver tails were similar in shape to flatfish if you used your imagination. They looked like they were covered in scales and they spent a lot of time underwater, therefore they're actually fish. And they provided a cheap stand in for the country's fishless poorer masses. But again, why stop there? The 17th century was no longer just the tail that was allowed on fast days, but the whole beaver itself. The beaver was a fish due to the fact it was an excellent swimmer. Unsurprisingly, the 17th century is the same year the beaver goes extinct thanks to overconsumption. Now the beaver is thriving once more again in England, Wales, and Scotland thanks to successful reintroduction programs from Canada, because we stay carrying that team. A medieval peasant walks into a bar and orders a drink, and has to correct the bartender because they ordered a cock ale, not a cocktail. This hilariously named beer was made by tossing a boiled and crushed dead cockerel with four pounds of raisins, nutmeg, mace, and a half pound of dates inside a canvas bag. The bag was then placed in ale and left there to steep for six or seven days. It was then bottled and kept still for a month, after which, ready for consumption. This was the most popular recipe as shared in a 1669 news article by Kelnan Digby. Why was this done to beer when it was already medieval times and it tasted bad enough? Well, it wasn't to produce dead chicken flavored beer, which is why strong herbs were there to overpower the chicken. The reason for ruining perfectly good beer with a giant chicken tea bag stemmed from the belief that the beer would be imparted with the cockerel's characteristics of strength, vigor, and courage. It was therefore mainly drunk by big manly men who wanted to be even bigger and even more manly. It was described as a pleasant drink, said to be provocative, aka it excited lust and aroused the body. In 19th century dictionary slang, cock ale was directly identified as a homely aphrodisiac. However, it naturally fell out of favor eventually for beer that didn't taste like dead chickens. I'm super angry about this one, but apparently it was only done in times of serious famine. It's roast cat. Cats were considered highly useful in keeping pests and vermin away. Dogs weren't so much of a commonplace thing and usually they were the first to be eaten pet wise when it came to serious food shortages. However, if the going gets tough, you have the option of hunting down some ferals in the woods to feed the fam. So, ever wonder how to roast a cat? According to one medieval recipe, you start off by cutting off the head and tossing it away because it is not for eating. They, for they say that eating the brains will cause him who eats them to lose his senses and judgment. Then you do the cleaning. At this stage, the feline may look ready to roast, but alas, you must first bury it in the ground for a day and a night before you do. Then you unbury it, spit it, roast it, and whip it with a green stick. You can serve the roasted cat by soaking it in broth and garlic. To quote the end of the recipe, and you may eat it because it is very good food, which I feel like they threw in because they knew folks were not sold on eating dead ground food. And of course, what better to end this list than literal garbage? A real, literal actual name for a medieval dish. The historical food blogs are fighting for their lives to try and say this recipe is super tasty, and they've used the old recipe to make it at home. I do not believe you. I will die on this hill. This is probably the worst titled dish in history and its ingredient list does not improve it. I have found four recipes and each is just worse than the rest, all going as far back as 1393. So most generically, you're going to need all the worst parts of a chicken. You need the head, the, the livers, the gizzards. Throw them into a nice pot. Add fresh beef broth, powdered pepper, 
pepper, cinnamon, cloves, mace, parsley, sage, all chopped small. Then take bread, like actual bread. Just take a whole loaf and just put that in the pot. Boil it, then put it through a strainer, then boil it again. Add powdered ginger, ver juice, which is unripe apple juice, mmm, salt, and a little saffron. Then serve it forth. To have it English style means leaving the pieces of animal and chunks in there. When you serve it, having it French style is to strain it once more and serve it just as a thin broth. Imagine making it brothy soup style, serving that to your buddies before telling them afterwards what they ate. Kicking off the list at number 10, an arming squire. Being a knight, okay, obviously this sounds cool on paper. They have the sword, they have the horse, the flowing lady, the gal on the back of said horse. They're saving the damsel in distress or something, right? Sometimes they lose a hand like Jamie Lannister, but that's just what being a knight is all about, right? Also, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen Game of Thrones nine years ago. It wasn't always a fairy tale epic being a knight. First of all, this process starts when you're seven years old as well. So you would be given to a noble to learn for seven years, and then at age 14, you became a squire. Ah, yes, a noble squire. We've heard this term before. What do they do? Uh, well, it's, it's a knight's intern. Yeah, not an ideal job to have when you're young, but it's a job nonetheless. Also, you had no choice, so you, you had to do it. Welcome to the Middle Ages. Arming squires, they had a lot of responsibility. Arming squires would repair a knight's armor while they were still wearing it. Yeah, how fun is that? Oh, which buckle was it? Ah, uh, yes, that one. Mm. Yeah, fixing up chainmail on a grown man's thigh. Not ideal, welcome to the Dark Ages. Pretty dark. Also, after these epic, messy battles, arming squires would have to clean everything off of their armor. Yeah, everything. A lot of yuck going on in that business day. This was long before Dawn soap was also a thing, so they had to clean with urine. Yeah, gross, so gross, it gets worse and worse. Welcome to the Dark Ages. Number nine, Plague Bearer. Yep, this one's as awful as it sounds. The title of this one really gives it away. Ah, the hot summer of July 1665. What to do with all of these poor souls who have been hit by the plague in the Dark Ages? Where do we put them, what do we do? You can't just hide them all in the catacombs this time around, so now what? Well, a plague bearer, he's got your back. Church wardens would organize burials, right? This was a normal thing even back in the Dark Ages in the 1600s, but when the plague hit, they had to change things up a little bit. If somebody had the plague, these guys would be responsible for transporting them far, far away and then burying them. A church would house these plague souls away from society. How grim is that? But it's probably a great call, all things considered. Poor guy. Number eight, a knight. When we think of the knights in you know, the Dark Ages and stuff, we often forget about the silly royal duties that one had to attend to. Yeah, you thought jury duty sucked. Oh boy. Beastly justice. You ever heard of this? If not, buckle in. Beastly justice was when animals had to go to court. Yeah, they were put on trial as well as well as humans. It's wild to look back at a knight and all the things they had to do for their kings and queens, but the fact they also had to wake up early and attend court like a noble, like royal court where a wild animal was now taking the stand. Like what a joke, I'd be like, really? Do I have to be here? I woke up at 4.30, what's going on? Yeah, this would happen after an animal runs through town. It would attack people, you know, being confused and being an animal and all, but the townsfolk would actually believe that the devil was somehow involved in this whole ordeal. Like these animals worked for Big Red himself, right? How weird is that? In 1457, villagers in France had to deal with six pigs who ran wild and attacked locals. They did a lot of damage, apparently. But instead of just, you know, setting the animals free or putting them down or whatever, they just took them to court. A real court, like a real trial. There was a judge, a couple prosecutors, eight witnesses, a defense attorney for the pigs, which I gotta say that we gotta do a list on that. That's a terrible job. That's one of the worst jobs ever, I, I lightly introduced here. These pigs were then hung from a gallows tree. It was so horrible. The dark ages, dark, right? A knight had to formally hang pigs after a trial was concluded. Yeah, being a knight sucked. Number seven, leech collector. I always enjoyed catching frogs growing up. That was always fun, but apparently I, I gotta step my game up. <laughs> this is weak. A leech collector is, well, exactly what you think. Back when medicine was pretty much non-existent, sickness was just wafting throughout these old towns, just eh, moving through towns. Like the G from the Goosebumps logo, just haunting towns, moving through. Scariest intro ever, eh? So the solution back in the day was the classic, oh, if you feel sick, maybe try bleeding for a bit. Mm, see if that helps. Yeah, they would use horses' legs to lure out these leeches, but most of the time, these leech collectors would have to get in and get dirty and just grab them themselves. They would have to swim around and touch as many things as possible. They would make contact with as many leeches as possible. How gross is that? That was the best way to collect them, really. 
I would have fainted so often, that is horrible. The loss of blood here was obviously so intense, so it was a, you know, horrible job to have. And on top of that, you gotta look out for the same reason they need leeches in the first place. Disease, yeah, that's still out there. Leech collectors were so common throughout the 18th century that leeches basically were extinct at that point. We almost lost leeches, oh, so close. Number six, jesters. The earliest accounts of the fool go back to the 11th century, so pretty OG. These fools were hired to liven up the party, you know, dance and be silly, wear pajamas. Most of you have an image of a jester in your head, you know, jumping around on tables, telling jokes. That's actually pretty accurate. Yeah, it was pretty fun. It was one of the best jobs to have, obviously. This title of a minstrel or a fool, rather, it was an honor to have. The fool's payment also was was no funny business, that was good stuff. Roland Le Petier, he was like a major jester back in the day. This guy got 30 acres of land from King Henry II. Just here, here you go. Just show up and fart and be funny. Have all this land. That's like a kingdom. You have a kingdom because you're funny and you're silly. He would whistle, jump around, and literally fart on people. On Christmas Day, this guy would come over and just ruin your entire breakfast and just be like, yeah, I have all this land. And then he would take off. Crazy, you just ruined Christmas, sir. Stop farting on my food and family, thank you. I would never want to be a jester. They had to also like go into battle and like spread bad news too. It was fun and silly, but they were also royal. They had to do lousy stuff too. Number five, groom of the stool. Nowadays, higher ups in the office, they have assistants, you know, to grab your coffee for you. Maybe they answer some phone calls, keep the business running while you're off, you know, doing your businessman stuff. Assistants are vital today. The groom of the stool though, that was, uh, huh, that was a bit much. We have some labor laws put in place now. I don't think we're gonna see any online ads opening for a groom of the stool. We'll see though, fingers crossed, I had good benefits. Back in the dark ages, this role was vital and respected. It was created by King Henry VIII and this role was to assist the king and specifically assist his bowel movements. You had a box that you carried with you at all times. That's where the, that's where the magic happened. The dark magic happened in this box. You would literally follow the king around until he needed to go to the washroom, until he needed said box. Porta potties weren't a thing back then and there's no way you're going to catch that king squatting in the woods. In fact, you wouldn't even catch that king wiping his own behind. That chore was also reserved for the groom of the stool. Yeah, lucky you, right? In this stool, you would have water, towels, a wash bowl. The whole setup would be in there. You're probably thinking, Taylor, which poor soul had to be stuck with this role? A prisoner? Somebody who lost their sense of smell, hopefully? No, only sons of noblemen could take on this role. And in doing so, they also gain access to every room in the castle, tons of clothes, any bedchamber furnishings, you name it. And of course, a high pay. Always helps, thank God. That's maybe the worst job in history, maybe. We're almost there, you'll see. Number four, divorce lawyers. If you've seen Game of Thrones, you've heard of trial by combat. That was the that was the norm back in the day. You know, you fight for your freedom. That's great. But what about divorce by combat? What in the Mr. and Mrs. Smith is happening? Was this real? I can't believe this. If you and your significant other weren't getting along in the dark ages, instead of, you know, dishing out thousands on couples therapy and signing all that paperwork and getting it done with and going your separate ways, no, instead they would battle each other. Like combat. It was an organized event too. It had restrictions in place for the husband. It's pretty hilarious to think back on. Like the husband would have to stand in a hole with one hand tied behind his back while the wife ran circles around this hole with a sack full of rocks. A sack full of rocks, how intense is that? That's why you don't cheat in the dark ages, Lancelot, okay? Just take the barn, take the horse, take it all, I quit. Get me out of this hole, untie me. Number three, toshers. Toss a coin to your tosher, here we go. This was one of the worst jobs back in the day and it wasn't even a legal job. Shh, don't tell. If you don't need, uh, if you don't need toshers, Keep, keep their secret, you know? Early 19th century London, I know, a little more modern here, but definitely worth a mention. These toshers would spend all their time in sewers below London trying to find coins or valuables that have been just accidentally washed away. Yeah, they would just search for scrap metals, anything really that nobody else wants to go down and claim, or reclaim rather. It was worth the plunge as well. A lot of these folks would make around 20,000 a year. Just gotta do this a lot, and you're good. Number two, dentist, doctor, surgeon, spy. Dentists were not a thing in the Middle Ages, you know. Dr. Downer didn't politely tell you to floss more and then shake your hands while you're watching a show, getting a cleaning. No, it wasn't like that at all. They did have a barber. They had one guy, he did it all. A barber from the Dark Ages. Yeah, this appointment is gonna suck, my friends. Cavity, toothache, maybe you accidentally bit a rock, chipped a molar. They would only pull these teeth. That was the only solution. Barbers were responsible for cutting hair, pulling teeth, bloodletting, you know, the classic three-in-one appointment we all have to do every month. Doctors were seen throughout history and they've seen a lot of horrible stuff. Back in the 1500s, patients were walking in with an arrow sticking out of their legs. Yeah, instead of cutting the tip off and pulling the opposite way, the arrow removed 
mover would come in and then, you know, cut into the injury, opening it more. That's always great. And then you would hold it open and then you'd pull the entire arrow back out of your leg. Yeah, what a fun job. Or chest, wherever the arrow went, you had to figure that out. It's poor soul. And finally, number one, the rat catcher. Another Game of Thrones classic. If you're a rat person, I know there's a lot of people who do like rats, like rat tricks and they have like cool rat friends. That's awesome. I'm not one of those people. I'm not bashing you, but I am bashing this job. This would suck. First of all, rats as a medieval punishment was horrible. Where do I even begin with this one? This was one of the worst punishments for the rats as well. This is a two for one when it comes to pain. A rat trap involved a man being tied down to something and then a metal enclosure would be strapped to his abdomen or chest. And then inside this enclosure, they were rats and they were also like tucked away and then historically they would heat the uh, metal enclosure and the rats would panic and try and get out and they would chew through the softest part which in this case was your chest or abdomen it was horrible it was an absolute nightmare but these rats had to come from somewhere or rather someone as the name hints towards rat catchers are one of the worst jobs you can have in or rather out of a castle it's an important role you know just like being a fool or a literal walking talking toilet there needs to be a chasseur de rats back in those times rats and mice were the leading source of spread disease and with these castles being big and dark there were probably a lot of them hiding black rats were a common household problem so we need to get those out so in comes the well-respected rat catcher these guys would sometimes try new spells to get rid of the rats wasn't always helpful wouldn't work more often than not didn't work so poison powders were the next main trick here also the Pied Piper, he was an OG historically. He would do a musical number to exterminate your pets. If anything, he should be getting a bonus. Any rat catcher actually today or back in the dark ages, you deserve a bonus, my friend. You're a brave soul. Number 10, Treaty of Verdun. The Treaty of Verdun or also known as Treaty de Verdun was a contract agreed on in August 843 in which divided the Frankish Empire into three kingdoms among the surviving sons of the Emperor Louis I. The firstborn son and heir of Charlemagne. Long story short, all the grandsons were all at civil war with each other about who was getting what, what did Grant promise. The treaty followed shortly after almost three years of wars between the brothers. It was the first in a series of partitions contributing to the dissolution of Charlemagne's empire and it is seen as a blueprint in which modern societies are based off of. Basically, the brothers all had to split what their grandfather had decreed his own into land. Lothair, the first, coolest name, Charlemagne's eldest son, received Francia Media, or the Middle Frankish Kingdom. Louis II received Francia Orientalis, or the East Frank Kingdom. And Charles II received Francia Occidentalis, or the West Frankish Kingdom. You and I both know the youngest got the most. Come on, I'm just gonna say it right out. Everyone likes to talk about the eldest son this and the eldest son that, but we all know the baby gets whatever they want whenever they want, don't they, huh? I'm looking at you, Taylor. Come here, man. It's true, man. The baby gets everything. Middle child? This guy didn't even exist growing up. Didn't hear from him. Number nine, underground castle. Big Chet and I are currently replaying Ocarina of Time, so in honor of Hyrule, I gotta include this medieval castle. It was once a residence during the reign of King Henry III. This castle was actually discovered recently underneath a prison yard back in 2015. The old prison castle, we love those. Shawshank Redemption 2, medieval edition. Super recent discovery. Archaeologists discovered walls of a castle underneath the basketball court in southwest England at a former prison. Yeah, dudes were shooting threes over top of kingdom and they had no idea. How amazing is that? This was the same castle that played part in the mid 1100s during England's civil war. The castle actually fell later in the 1400s and the prison was built on the grounds later in the 1700s until it closed its gates forever in 2013. And then we were shooting threes and then we discovered it, of course. If I was a ghost haunting these grounds, I would make every shot miss easily i would just float near the net tap the ball away like nice try mm. back to prison mm. number eight stone masonry so we all know about who wrote what and who translated what to what text and which language while writing what play, which was based on who, but who built all this stuff? When we think of the Dark Ages, we can't forget the megalithic Leviathan stones carved and molded together to create the enormous Gothic castles and cathedrals that are still standing to this day. How did people do it back then? Well, masons in medieval England were responsible for building. Masons were highly skilled craftsmen and their trade was primarily used in the building of castles, churches, and cathedrals. There were three main classes of stone masons. There was the apprentice, the journeyman, and the master mason. So what would a medieval construction site exactly look like? Well, of course, there's the master mason. He's usually the head and the overseer of the work, and he's the most skilled of the tradesmen. This is like the head honcho on site. We've all seen this guy walking around site. He's always angry, he's always yelling, hey, who's got the plans? You, give me those, what are these? Eh, yeah, backwards, you idiot. I would've put the window down there. So how did they exactly chisel out all of these castles from one giant rock? Well, they didn't. The stone had to be quarried first 
from quarrymen. These were not masons. Their job was to get the stone for the masons to work on out of the ground. Local stone was used first, but occasionally stone could travel vast distances, even from other countries. And so I gotta drag that boulder there all the way to Scotland? Okay. Some of the most beautiful architecture ever created can be still seen across Europe. The amount of time and skill it took for these people to have designed, constructed, and chiseled such megalithic sites still baffles me. I'd be trying to read the plan still. Oh, I s that's north. I got the, I got it. We're good. Number seven, apple bobbing. In a time where bodies were literally piling up on the side of the road, I can't believe we got apple bobbing out of the whole ordeal. That's crazy. It seems like ill timing, but it is the dark ages. What can you do? Apples historically have always been a symbol of importance. The Greek golden apple started the Trojan War. Snow White's poison apple was a symbol of importance in literature and all that good stuff from growing up. And in the middle ages, apples were viewed as a symbol of romance and fertility. These things have roots, pun intended, of course. In medieval times, bobbing for apples was flirty. It was their version of speed dating, dare I say. What happened was all the leftover apples from the big harvest were then put into a big bucket. Each apple had a villager's name on it, and then maidens would have three chances. Three chances to grab that apple with their teeth. Three chances to win a date with the English Tad Hamilton. What a weird time. Can you imagine if this was in Game of Thrones? Reek is just shivering for two seasons, bobbing for Ramsay's Bolton apples. We're like, medieval times were dark, holy sh**. Number six. The feudal system, aka feudalism, was a form of structure system existing in medieval Europe in which people would work and fight for nobles who gave them protection and land in return. A social political system in which landowners would contractually bind tenants to exchange their goods, loyalty, and simple space for safety and comfort within the laws of those ruling. Basically, this is like our renter's agreement now. I'll give you a place to stay and some heat. You give me an unfathomable and overpriced amount of shillings for these extremely low ceilings. Yeah, talk about crooks, man. This system stayed in place for more than a thousand years and managed to fizzle its way out of society somewhere in the 15th century. Not just anybody would ask to be signed to this deal. There was structure and there was order. There was a lord, AKA the landowner, AKA your landlord, allowing vassals, AKA tenants, to rent the land by providing services especially military services. Yeah, you can stay here, but once in a while, we're gonna need you to dump a bunch of boiling water and over that wall. Is that cool? Yeah, you're fine with that. The plot of land, called a fief, was typically worked on by serfs who were laborers who had very few rights and were bound to the land itself. These were the lowest class of people, and they basically did any and all to stay safe on the Lord's land. Jobs would include farming, jobs would include cleaning, and was a minimum of three days work to maintain a good standing and remain stationary. Ah, sure, there was no dental or mental health days, but come on. A three day work week? Plant a couple of carrots here and there? Yeah, it doesn't seem that bad. Number five, fear the dead. With The Walking Dead on their 47th season, I think it's time to take a peek into zombie history, shall we? And find out where this grim idea really started. Well, it's certainly not a new one, I'll tell you that for free. As far back as the early 1300s, residents were buried in the village of Warren Percy, where archeologists discovered them many moons later, and they discovered marks on their bones. Cuts, burn marks, you name it. Apparently, this was all done after they had passed away. But why? Scientists believe that these injuries inflicted after their untimely death were to prevent them from being reanimated. You know, coming back to life and haunting your village. To keep them in their graves, of course. Unless this dude did something to piss off an entire village that much, they were clearly afraid of this corpse coming back to haunt them. Number four. Studia Generali. This period also saw the birth of what we call the modern university. This was a culmination of material translated and taught to provide a new infrastructure to scientific scholars. Some of these new universities were registered by the Holy Roman Empire as an institution of international excellence, giving it the title Studium Generali, or better known as Studia Generale. Most of the early Studia Generale were discovered in Italy, Spain, England, and France. These places of study were considered the most prestigious places of learning in all of Europe. I bet you this school hoodie were still so expensive. Just someone's old textbook with a mustache drawn on Marcus Aurelius. The list and number of institutions began to grow as new universities were founded throughout Europe. As early as the 13th century, scholars from the Studia Generale were encouraged to speak and lecture courses at other institutions within Europe to share documents and information which led to the current academic culture seen in modern universities today. It's a TED talk, come on. There had to be one cool professor back then, like the guy who lets the class teach itself, orders pizza, has tenure, and hates the monarchy. Number Number three, medieval taverns. Say you want to grab a pint with the local lads. Where do you get an IPA in the dark ages? Where do we get a six pack of Arthurian ale? Well, this is the medieval ages, so instead of venturing through the woods to hopefully 
Maybe find another town, just ask thy neighbor. That's right, in the Middle Ages, you could brew your own ale. No problem, no one's asking any questions. Give it a shot. In the late 12th century, baking bread was not freely permitted, but making ale in your basement was. Uh, yeah, I guess that's great. So the higher ups, the noble lords, they wouldn't care if you made ale and had a block party. But if you made a weak ale or it was improperly measured and then distributed, then and only then do you get a fine. Arrest this man at once. Number two, St. Patrick. St. Patrick was a fifth century Roman British Christian missionary and bishop in Ireland. Also known as the Apostle of Ireland, although he is the first apostle, having lived prior to the current laws of the Catholic Church. He is considered a saint in the Catholic Church and is regarded as the Enlightener of Ireland. The dates of Patrick's life are not certain, but there is a consensus that he was active in Ireland during the 5th century, making his rounds as a missionary, speaking the good word of God. But let's get into what everyone talks about with this guy. The good stuff, like slamming a green Guinness or getting all the snakes out of Ireland. I mean, I love the structure and the faith and stuff, but also chasing every snake out of an entire country with a walking stick? Shoo! Shoo, you fool, you bleeding bleeder, go, go! Do you know how big Ireland is? St. Patrick's Day is on March 17th, the supposed date of his death in 461 AD. It is enjoyed inside and outside Ireland as a religious and cultural holiday and remains a celebration of Ireland itself. And finally, number one, Dancing plague. A medieval plague, but make it groovy. Yeah, let's start dancing. That's right, the dancing plague. This was a real danger back in 1518. I'll try not to laugh, but it's, I can't, I'll try. This was perhaps one of the weirdest events in history. Fra Trofea was the first victim of said plague. She was moving her body around frantically, so much so that it resembled a dance or something, in the middle of the Holy Roman Empire. And as if that wasn't weird already, dozens of others began to join. And then more, and then more, all moving their bodies with a similar wacky frantic twist. This was long before Chubby Checker came along, so we still have no idea what was going on here. Like, we're out of guesses at this point. This twist lasted for months. People were dropping on the spot. It was scary and confusing. In total, there were around 400 victims that fell to this mysterious illness. That's a lot of deaths, that's a lot of real deaths. This was documented in 16th century historical records, so I don't think the story is made up per se. No one would make this up, it's terrifying. A Catholic saint at the time, Saint Vitus, was believed to have the power to curse people with said dancing plague. What an amazing power also. Guy starts moonwalking away, you're like, beat it. Some suggest this was a cult, others believe they ate toxic rye. Who's to say for sure, either way. We're all dancing. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have heresy. Okay, I can admit when I'm wrong, and in the last video last week, I messed up. I said the wrong word when talking about spoiled queens. You guys pointed it out. Yeah, I read your comments. Okay, and now we're here to redeem ourselves. I'm learning. You're already smart. Let's get into it. In medieval times, it could be dangerous to disagree. Nowadays, many people like to keep an open mind. There's so many cultures, beliefs, people think different things, and that is totally okay. But it absolutely was not okay in the Dark Ages. Oh no. In these times, if you held any kind of belief that could go against the teaching of the Christian church, you were seen as a heretic. Many leaders, whether kings or crusaders, or even missionaries and merchants, especially from the late 11th century, fought to have Christianity take over in the Mediterranean world. People belonging to other faiths, such as Jewish and Muslim people, suffered persecution and expulsion. In England, there were massacres, and in the late 12th century, Edward I banned all Jewish people from England. I mean, this quite literally set the stage for the Spanish Inquisition in 1478, which was aimed at establishing Spain as a united, single Christian faith. Wars in medieval Europe weren't just waged on people of different faiths, however, it was also aimed at some Christians who people believed to be heretics. This is all to say that heresy was a serious crime in these times, and thinking outside of what you were told to think at the time and what was accepted could have landed you a death sentence. Number nine, facial expressions. I can't grow facial hair. I'm not sure if you noticed that watching, but it's never happened. It's not gonna happen, quite frankly. I don't have to worry about trimming a beard early in the morning, anything like that which is fine, to be honest with you. I can, I'm not really complaining. Back in the medieval ages, I would have been set. People would have been pretty, I don't know, would have been more than ideal. The no hair look was the way to do it. The forehead was seen as the central point of your face, so it was common back in the medieval times for individuals to pluck all of their eyelashes and remove their eyebrows completely. So people would just be looking at you like, Nothing going on, no facial expressions, just bald everything. Many would go as far as to pluck their hairline back even further so they have the round, oval, queen, bald look. 
Imagine that. Imagine everyone's bald in Game of Thrones. Think it'd still get the rankings that it does? Probably not. Probably not. Macy Williams is just... In our number eight spot today, we have Animal Court. The history of animals being put on trial goes back pretty far, as it is believed it has roots in ancient Athens, but it was definitely a common practice as recently as the 18th century. Courts would go after things like rats, weevils, flies, locusts, and serpents for damaging crops, and when punished, they weren't just liable for damages, they could be banished and excommunicated. Like, imagine trying to banish a fly. This isn't where it ends, though. In civil criminal court, they'd have livestock being tried for violent against humans. Like, I'm sorry, your honor, my client could not tell the prosecution that she didn't want to be milked because she's a cow. Kicking was the only way. As an example of a real animal court case, let's take it back to 1457 France. Villagers in a town witnessed a sow and her six piglets attack and kill someone. Terrible story, sounds absolutely horrifying to have to witness. In this day and age, animal control would be called and all of those pigs would likely put down. But not in these times. When this happened, all the pigs were sent to court. Like real court. There was a judge, two prosecutors, eight witnesses, and a defense attorney for the accused animals. Witnesses provided testimony that proved that the sow had most definitely attacked the person and was definitely responsible for the crime. The piglets, however, well, for them, testimony was a bit murkier. There wasn't a witness who actually saw any of the piglets do any actual attacking. They just had blood on them, which isn't necessarily a sign of their guilt. It just means that they were there. This is why the court, while they did sentence the sow to death, the piglets were exonerated for their role in the crime. It's very strange and now would be a very expensive system, but in those times, it really did work for them. Number seven, inns and taverns. When we think of a medieval tavern or an inn, it's important to note the difference. Yes, there's drinking in both, and yes, both of them don't smell so great. But inns, their sole purpose was to house travelers comfortably, whereas a tavern, not so much housing. More rough housing, if anything, if you catch my drift. Say you're passing by one of these taverns, right, Saturday night, you feel like grabbing some questionable ale from some questionable establishment, well, you better come prepared. In the Middle Ages, you had to bring your own fork everywhere you went. Just a single, just one fork on your side, on your person, that's so gross. We didn't have a guy sitting in booth 11 doing roll-ups all night, looking at you, just wishing that he didn't work there, right? This was the Middle Ages, you didn't have a fork. No one had forks. If you had a fork, you were lucky, right? You were the rich kid on the block with an in-ground pool. That was you if you had a fork. Steak knives also were only reserved for carvers, so until the 17th century, you were just poking around your meal until you had a bite-sized amount, and then you but choke on it because it's all horrible. It's all chewy and horrible. In our number six spot today, we have the filth. If you lived in a city during this time in history, it would have been an absolutely filthy place to be. I mean, human and rats lived in harmony. Not harmony, re the plague. But things were so dirty, rats were everywhere. Want to go swimming in the nice stream nearby? Huh, well, good luck, because not only is that body of water used for dumping sewage, but it's also for the village's water supply to both drink and bathe in. Disease was plentiful, obviously, and it spread exceptionally quickly. Spreading disease was even easier considering how all of the homes were packed full of people and no one really knew anything about hygiene and the benefits yet health and otherwise. If you were to go out in the evening, especially at past curfew, it was also an insanely huge risk. Going out ran you the risk of getting killed or robbed with no police on the streets to help protect you at all. While city living provided a bit of safety in numbers situation compared to the countryside and also provided more opportunities to make money, it was still quite a risky place to live during the dark ages. Number five, teeth worms. Awesome, you have any cavities? Now you're gonna be looking this whole video. Dentists weren't common back in the dark ages, but they did have a barber. So I guess we're good for a few hundred years. This guy did it all. Cavities, toothaches, teeth, worms, gross, you name it, he'll pull it out violently. Barbers were responsible for cutting hair, pulling teeth, bloodletting, your classic three-in-one appointment right there, really, all in 10 minutes or less. Instead of brushing with tooth tunes, back then you would rub your teeth and gums with a rough linen. Yeah, just grab an old shirt. It's an old dirty shirt we're gonna brush up for school. Like you're playing a harmonica, only dirty shirt. A few recipes have been discovered since for pastes and powders to freshen their breath back then, you know. Otherwise, you were pretty screwed. You had nothing. We went from powdered charcoal to charcoal toothpaste all over again. What a weird loop we did. 
Mouthwashes were also made from herbs and spices steeped in wine or vinegar, so fresh breath guaranteed, no doubt about it. In our number four spot today, we have the stripes ban. We've all met someone before who seems to be concerned with what other people are wearing, and we jokingly refer to them as the fashion police. But back in the dark ages, you might come across some very real fashion police who are actually interested in fining you, should your finest tunic not be of the local dress code. Sometimes it wasn't even just a fine. Some serious fashion faux pas could lead to your imprisonment or even your death. Stripes were definitely a main culprit in these times, as striped clothing was seen as a garment of the devil. I'm not even exaggerating either. In the year 1310 in a French town, there was a local cobbler who was put to death because he had been caught in striped clothes. Yeah, we thought the tabloids were harsh, and I mean, they are, but the medieval fashion police were unforgiving. Not only were members of clergy not exempt from this rule, but neither were animals. Yeah, calling all zebras. Good luck out there, man. This is why zebras were called beasts of the devil. And yes, this is even though the people of Europe hadn't even seen them just heard tales of their striped nature. Number three, no rules football. In honor of the World Cup coming to a close, we have to take a look at football back in the late 12th century. Yeah, what did that look like? Or feel like, rather? Instead of corner kicks and throw-ins, you could do anything you wanted to retrieve the ball from the opposing team. Yeah, anything. Left hooks, some kicks, some jabs, throwing rocks, anything, you name it, it was violent. No diving in these games, I'll tell you that for free, you didn't have to. There was also no time limit. <clears throat> there was also no limit to how many players could be involved. So choose your team wisely, pick the biggest guy, pretty much. It's town versus town a lot of the time. There's a lot of emotions out there settled on the field. And in the middle of it somewhere, there would be a soccer ball rolling around. I would call this a sport. Now finally, come 1314, King Edward II banned the game. And yeah, more than fair. Pause civilians and citizens are dying. He's like, yeah, maybe not. Maybe it's not wise. I don't know. In our number two spot today, we have fast medieval marriage. There are so many messed up medieval marriage practices. We could do an entire video on just that. And in fact, we have. Go check those out. But while you're here, let's talk just a bit about them. Marriage in the medieval times was quick and easy, but also difficult to prove. If you and your loved one wanted to get married, all you really needed to do was say, we're married, and then boom, it's done. Of course, this led to a whole pile of those spur of the moment type marriages, especially considering how sex before marriage was widely condemned in these times. You know, people are like, eh, it. We're married now, let's do it. Well, I'm pretty sure many people who were divorced would have preferred if their marriages were this easy. This led to people, of course, taking advantage of this difficult to prove thing. Most especially women would often fall victim to a man who might want to take you as his wife for the night. But then the following day, after getting what he wants, he denied ever agreeing to the union of the two. If you're catching my drift. This is why many women tried to get at least one witness to union, just in case. And finally, number one. Pointed shoes. This one's so fun. Whenever I see anything that's related to the medieval times, I always admire the attire, right? Especially the shoes. I hate buying shoes today so much. Now they're so specific. You got walking, running, trail shoes. They're always so expensive. Nobody does it like the medieval times anymore. Specifically, Krakows. Krakows were awesome. They were the style of shoe commonly worn in the 15th century Europe that looked really ridiculous. They had the long, huge long nose that went up really high. They're so silly looking, maybe that's why I love them. These long toed shoes first appeared in the 12th century, but the Krakow, the thing is, these things were twice as long as your foot, and that was considered fancy back then. These meant business, so you better watch those ankles, Beth, all right? We're going into some meetings fast. They were named after the city that they were made in. Krakows were worn by everybody at one point, but as cheeky as it sounds, the longer the shoe, the more valuable you were. There we go. So it turned into a joke eventually, right? These things got way too long and it looked ridiculous. You ever walk around in flippers beside the pool where you do that big silly walk? That's the walk that everybody was doing in town, right? It was out of hand. They would be stuffed with horse hair or moss. Yeah, which is just as comfortable as Dr. Scholl's. Imagine stepping around in moss all day, yuck. Also, sometimes a string would be needed to be tied from the tip of the shoe to your knee just to keep these damn things afloat. So everybody at one point in time, in the medieval times, looked like a Muppet tied to strings. How amazing is that? Do you own any Krakows? If so, how do we get our hands on a pair? I'm a size 11 and a half Krakow. Let's make it happen. Maybe if we all pitch in as a community. I don't know, we can all be wearing Krakows tomorrow.